Okay, good evening everyone. I'm calling to order the school committee business meeting for Monday, October 2nd at 6.30. Ms. Yell, whenever you're ready with the roll call. Here. Excuse me, Mayor Brianna. Is absent. Sarah Hall. Here. Brianna Higgins. Here. Juliet Walker. Present. Brian Callahan. Here. Steve Cole. Here. Bruce Menning. Here. Okay, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Before we begin public comment, I'm going to read uh, a few reminders. Please keep to topics within the school committee's scope of authority. We encourage civility. Be mindful of the fact that this is a public meeting which is being live streamed and recorded for all ages in our community. Please be aware that this is not an opportunity for discussion and you will not receive a response at this time. You will have two minutes for your comment longer comments can be sent to the school committee via email. Um, so first on the list we have Christine Moir. Am I saying that correctly? Uh, is I thought it was a sign in list. My apologies. Oh, so you're, so you're not speaking? No. Okay, so uh, Katie Suchecki then. Yeah, so if you don't mind just coming up to the podium here, that way we capture your comments. Um, on the recording. I, so it, if you can just state your name and address, um, and then I'll start your two minutes, okay? Yep. My name is Kate Suchecki, and my address is 8 Toppins Lane. Um, and as you know, um, part of our, I'm the co-president of the PTO, um, and part of the role of the PTO is to act as a liaison between parents and school administrators and any relevant city officials. It is also our job to advocate for our children's welfare. We have received some communication from parents about the safety of our children getting to school. They are concerned about street safety, specifically that one of our children will be hit by a car. There was robust discussion about this at our last PTO meeting, which Mayor Reardon kindly attended. In addition to the mayor, we met with Superintendent Gallagher last week. We believe it is also our duty to ensure that every school committee member is aware of this issue and fully committed to finding a solution to the problem. We understand there is a difficulty filling cross crossing guard positions, but we can't just leave it at that. More needs to be done, and we are asking for the school committee's help in ensuring that all children get to school safely. That is it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Did we have anyone else who wanted to speak in public comment this evening? All right, we'll move on to our uh, recognitions. All right. All right, best part of the job tonight, here we go. Um, well, first of all, just like all of our school committee meetings, we've always have taken time out in the beginning to recognize students and staff um, for outstanding performances. And uh, the three people we'll be recognizing tonight, I consider them uh, the unsung heroes of the district. Um, they're the liaison for our students uh, with learning disabilities, and they work with staff, families, parents, and guardians. Um, they put in long hours. They go beyond the call of duty, time in and time out. I see them working late, calling parents, and uh, just really being there to reassure our students uh, and families. You know, this year we've talked about our tiered uh, focus monitoring that uh, Miss O'Connor will be talking about that inherited uh, over the summer and there was a lot of documents um, that needed to be uploaded to the state and these three people that we're recognizing um, took the time uh, off duty time on the weekends and uh, late hours to assist with that endeavor and I just think they always put students first in the community since I've been here so it's an honor to be recognizing these three 
people tonight. And we'll start with our first recognition, um, Ms. Gina Gardino. And I'm going to read a little bio. It's like the starting lineup. So uh, <laughs> Ms. Gardino has been uh, in the special education team coordinator at the high school for the past 10 years. She holds a professional uh, license in administration of special education at all levels. She was previously an adjustment counselor and a licensed mental health counselor. Prior to her employment in Newburyport, she was an adjustment counselor and a mental health practitioner uh, in district team chairperson also. She graduated from Suffolk University and holds a master's from Cambridge College. So come on up, Ms. Gardino. Yeah, sure. All right. Congratulations. Ms. Furlong, you want to know one? I'm going to have you stand up here, too, because we do a team picture at the end. <laughs> Yeah. So the um, sorry, you want to jump in? We'll take a picture sure. first. I feel like you should be in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. It's just have to stay on the family fridge for one year. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So you can stay up here. Okay, All right. Our next recognize. Yeah. You want to hold those? Sure. Perfect. Our next person we're recognizing is Miss Elise Camo um, at the NOC. Miss Camo is also a special education team coordinator for the NOC and the Molin schools, holds a professional license in administration, special ed at all levels. She's been with the district for three years, going into her fourth year now. Prior to her employment in Newburyport, she was special education out of district coordinator and an in district team facilitator for seven years. She also holds a certification of moder moderate special needs, PK to 12, and teacher for the deaf at all levels. She graduated from Smith College and holds a master's from the University of Massachusetts. So come on up, Ms. Kamal. And new to the team is Miss Erin Gibson. Um, and she jumped right in this summer, and has, it's almost like she's been working here for the past 10 years. So we appreciate your collaboration and your willingness to assist, and she's already been a great teammate for everybody. So Miss Gibson is a special education team coordinator at the Bresnahan. She holds a professional licensure in administration of uh, special ed at all levels. She's new to the district and, as we say, hit the ground running this summer. Prior to her employment in Newburyport, she worked 13 years as a special education teacher and school psychologist. She's also certified moderate disabilities, pre-K to 12, teacher of uh, the deaf at all levels, graduated George Mason University and a master's degree from College of William and Mary. So come on up. take a brief recess for some congratulations.
Okay, everyone, we're going to uh, jump back into our meeting. <laughs> So what? Yeah, a gavel. A gavel. Oh. Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> um, calling the meeting back into session. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're, we'll start in again with our consent agenda. Mr. Callahan, you have warrants ready? I do. I move that the following name bills of the Newburyport Public Schools amounting in the aggregate $216,734.60 be approved and forwarded to the city auditor for payment. There are no conflicts. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we have one set of minutes to approve. Uh, it's from our last meeting, the September 18th meeting. Are there any corrections? All right, can I get a motion? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, it's time for our student representative report. Take it away. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Callahan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. Um, so news from the high school today, it was great to see so many students and families participating in the college fair this past week. Switching to a regional model has definitely helped recruit a larger number of colleges and employers to participate in this event. And we thank Mr. Smith from our college and career department for coordinating this event as we work to support all of our students in uh, higher education. Perfect. Thank you. Now, uh, moving on, last Friday's fall rally allowed our students and staff to have some fun while recognizing different areas of the high school. The students brought the energy level up a notch as we celebrated our fall teams, along with the unveiling of the Sailbot Championship Trophy. The Clippers cheer team led us in spirit cheers, and our band enhanced the, fe the fe festive feeling of the rally. Also, thank you to Al Sullivan for leading us in the Star Spangled Banner. We want to give special thanks to Mr. Pace for his organization of the rally, and also a big thanks to Stephen D'Ambrosio, Carly McDermott, Owen Cruz, Eli Raymond, Annie Kate Ames, and Ryan Gaspero for taking the reins on leading the assembly. Also, thank you to Mr. Gallagher for doing his yearly cartwheel feat. <laughs> Hope your brother is doing better. <laughs> <laughs> we, we really hope so. <laughs> but uh, this week, a team of educators, part of the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, visited Newburyport High. Every 10 years, high schools undergo a process to me measure themselves against the standards of accreditation. Now this team uh, of, it, of educators visited classrooms, met with students, parents, teachers, and the administration. Over the course of the next month, we will receive a report that highlights our <coughs> strengths and also offers recommendations to incorporate into our school improvement plan. Thank you to all of the students and parents who participated in interviews across the week. Also, thank you to everyone for welcoming our visitors across the building. Additionally, our 20 German exchange students from Germany have adjusted wonderfully to their accommodations in the United States. This week, they will participate in a number of activities, including a tour of Harvard College tomorrow and a trip to the Ipswich Crane Estate on Thursday. All right, uh, now to National Merit Accommodations. Matthew De DeSimio Maloney and a Eamon Fidel received a National Merit Accommodation. Uh, they are among 30,000 students nationwide who have shown exceptional academic promise based on results from last year's PSAT slash NMSQT exam. And lastly, we just want to end with the news of the ALS Cup um, versus Pentucket on Saturday. Um, this raises money for Lou Gehrig's disease, also known as ALS, and former Newburyport High School boys coach Dave Greenblatt started it in 2002. Since then, it's become an incredible event celebrating soccer and supporting, and supporting our teams. On Saturday, over 2,000 people attended. Both varsity boys and girls team won. Girls won three to one and boys won four zero. Student support was amazing, along with support from Newburyport and Pentucket region uh, residents and families. And we hope for this event to continue as a strong Newburyport tradi tradition and look forward to more events like this in the future. And that's all from us, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you.
Theo and Lizzie. Um, Theo, I'm gonna put you on the spot for a second because rumor has it that you're leading that tour of the Ipswich Crane Estate. I was gonna put Is that on. correct? Yeah, that, that would be correct. Will you be in your full butler regalia? Yeah. <laughs> I wish I could be there. <laughs> That's wonderful that you're that you're doing that. Thank you. Uh, I just have uh, one uh, thing. Please. Uh, we participated in the German exchange student. Yeah. Um, we found out the week before <laughs> that we were gonna do it. So all of a sudden we have three kids living in a house. Uh, it's been great, the kids have been great. There's a ton of activities for them to do, but even when they're not, the group of them has been super active with the American kids. So much so that my wife said, it's like we're running an Airbnb, because the kids are at home to eat and sleep, and then that's it, and they're just going out <laughs> doing stuff. So it's been uh, super fun having the that's people, great. people around. That's great to hear. All right, um, up next, we're going to hear about the NASDAQ executive search. You want to introduce yes, that a little? Yes, absolutely. Um, as we've been talking about since our retreat, our um, special, edu special education director, director of uh, pupil services uh, replacement, um, we really uh, wanted to do a comprehensive search in this point. We've contracted uh, with NESTEC and Dr. David DeRuzzi will kind of give the school committee an overview of uh, what the search is going to look like. Um, we really, I think, hearing from parents and community members um, really want to make this position uh, one that's going to get the right person in. Uh, someone's going to stay with Newburyport for a long time. And we feel uh, it's time for the district to do a full comprehensive search. And uh, NASDAQ has had a lot of success doing that. So, Mr. DeRuzzi. Thank you very much. On behalf of NASDAQ, uh, we really do appreciate the fact that you have made the conscious choice to go with us. Um, I'm relatively new to NASDAQ. I started October 1st of last year as the associate director. I was a superintendent for multiple years in Massachusetts, high school principal. Uh, so I was an assistant SPED director also, so I ended up. <laughs> but um, I started with NASDAQ October 1, and uh, Dr. Art Betancourt uh, retired in June, and now basically I am the interim executive director. So I am here tonight on behalf of who will be your lead consultant, Mike Palladono. And uh, Mike is perfect for the job. He has a lot of history. He ran um, collaboratives for years. He is uh, understanding of special ed in the world of special ed. And he and I just kind of teamed up and did a Douglas search last year for a special ed director. So he is uh, unfortunately away tonight. He'll be back. He will be getting in touch with Pamela and moving forward. So I'm here just to give you kind of this overview of the search process and what to expect. He will come in, do a full-blown orientation with you. And if you have any questions tonight, uh, you bounce them towards me, I'd be more than happy to answer them, but I'll also bring them back so Mike's aware. So I'll debrief him on the whole meeting. So uh, what a comprehensive search is all about. Figure right now about 120 days worth of a search. So it starts with an overview where Mike will come back in and he'll walk you right through every step of the search. What you will be asked to do in the very near future is to come up with a liaison, too, actually. Someone that will be working with the search team, which is Mike, myself, NESDEC, and somebody else that, as we send a lot of information, packets, you don't have to really reinvent the wheel on a lot of this. We have templates for you to use. So we always like to have somebody we can send the documents to that can then get them out into the hands of everybody ahead of time. What Mike will do with all of you is you put together a letter of what we call application, and he will help you put that together. Basically, it is a highlight of what makes Newburyport special. So it's an application letter, but you talk about your school, you talk about your community, we pull it all together, Mike will work with you, and that's what we use as an application. So people will get a solid understanding of, if I was looking for the job, who and what this district is in the community it represents. Timeline. Mike will come in, work with you, figure, like I said, roughly 120 days. So the first question will be, when do you want to appoint the new person? Not have them start, but appoint. 
So if you think of about 120 days, you're well within a window. You're gonna fall somewhere most likely right around the beginning or near February break. Mike will work backwards. He'll come in with a timeline. And then that timeline is a draft. It goes before the school committee. You look at it. If it fits, it works great. If not, tweak the dates a bit. This is your search. We're here to work with you, for you, and make sure that your search meets your needs. So we work with everybody in the district, with the school committee, and if a date doesn't fit, you're like, nope, you tell us what date it does, we make it fit. So there's a piece too, um, in talking with your team prior to this, I know that there's really a need to bring people together to get them invested, meaning the community, the staff. So part of this comprehensive search, you have up to six focus groups. We're seeing some <coughs> success doing some focus groups in a online virtual Zoom format as well as in person. Again, we leave that up to you, how many you want, which way or the other. But uh, the focus groups do a lot because it's based on the information we get from the focus groups. We pull all that information together and we develop what they call a candidate profile. And a candidate profile will outline the key values that you're looking for in the next special ed director. Again, we put it all together, we draft it, we give it to the school committee, they look at it, they approve it, and then that becomes the document that your screening committee will begin to use to guide their questions during the search. If I'm going too fast, just stop me because I'm trying my best to um, keep it under. I could talk for hours, but I won't. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, so now you get your, your piece there, you do your focus groups, survey is involved online. You're gonna be able to pull a lot of people in. You'll hear their voice. You'll have a ton of information. Our job is to condense it all down. We hand you a draft of a candidate profile listing three or four major aspects you're looking for. The real work, and this is where Mike will be a big help to you, is putting together your screening committee. And why do I say that's the real work? They, that is the lion's share of the work being done. So the screening committee is an important tool. They come in, they work hard, and it, we'll send you information packets, Mike will go over this, on who do you really want on the screening committee. We always say the numbers can range from nine to 12. I sat on one recently with 22. That's a big screening committee. That's a lot to juggle. But for the most part, what you wanna think about is who needs to be in the room during that first initial interview process. So we always say think of positions, not just people. So you may want a CPAC parent there because it's special ed and they understand that. And if it's a parent in the district and it's CPAC, you get kind of two bangs for your buck. So that's how we try to advise you. It's a, it's a hard piece to manage because you might get 100 people that wanna be on it. So we'll work with you. We offer some suggestions on how to do that. And the screening committee is really the most important part of the process because it's a time commitment. People will be involved. You may be setting up interviews on Saturdays. At night, you can't miss one and then be on a screening committee. So again, big piece, begin to think about how you'd wanna develop that screening committee. And again, we'll supply you with letters of intent, you know, how you could just draft the letter, we'll do it. You use our template, you fill in the blanks, and we can get you the screening committee. So the first training is with the screening committee, teaching them how to be a screening committee. <coughs> then they get all the applicants. We do not screen, NESDEC won't. If 500 people apply, we're gonna, and they're all certified and qualified, we give those 500 to the screening committee. And the way the screening committee will then view that is they'll get a, uh, a link and a passcode. So each screening committee member will then, after their first training session, have this link. They go in to take their time, but they will review each and every candidate. And we offer them an electronic piece 
it's kind of, it's a way to rank them so you're not trying to <laughs> juggle 400 pounds of paper. You can just say, well, we saw, you know, this Dr. David DeRussi, and you know what? I like him. I'm going to say, we'll put him up. Definitely want to interview him. Another person, this is all done in isolation. So there's no back and forth. We stress <laughs> confidentiality. So if this was my screening committee, you get to see all the names and you pick and choose who you want to see, you do, and we tally it all up electronically. So everybody goes through all of that. Definitely want to see Dr. DeRussi. Eh, might want to see Dr. DeRussi. Definitely do not want to see Dr. DeRussi, so it's a click. And then it'll all tally up. The second meeting, now this is about a week span. The second meeting, the NASDAQ consultant will come in, have it all ranked. Now the deliberation starts. Now it's, well, most of the people wanted to see Dr. DeRussi. He came out high. Uh, but then, you know, Dr. Smith, uh, kind of in the middle, and it'll rank them. That's where, with the help of the NASDAQ consultant, there's the deliberation. Somebody may want to see somebody that maybe did not make that top tier. <coughs> you talk about it and then it goes back and forth. But at the end of that session, you'll have your people that you will be bringing in to screen. So then we set up, work with you to set up a calendar. NASDAQ consultant will call each person, tell them to come in, when to come in, and then you do the interviews. We do not attend, we can if you want us there, but we find if we're in the room, it, it met, the candidate might be talking to the NESDEC person, not the screeners. And I think that's an important part. So we take a step back. However, we're on call. So Mike will know when that meeting is happening. And if for any sec you need a five minute, you give Mike a call, you could give me a call, and, it, and, it, and we can walk you through a potential problem. After that, you do your screening. NESDEC comes back, and then it's like, okay, who do you move up to the next phase? So that will also be decided. Now, most of the time, a search of this magnitude for a superintendent, we would then, screening committee gives the people up to the school committee to make the final interviews and final decisions. In this case, that'll all be worked out. Who is gonna make the final decisions and how that'll all be vetted out? Again, you'll do that with Mike as part of the process. So if everything goes smoothly from start to finish, you should be in good shape, have your timeline, have your communications, and find yourself what we hope would be a, a very good, solid candidate to run the special ed programs here in Newburyport. All right. Thank you. Mike will spend way more time <laughs> with you. He'll go into great details on surveys and focus groups, but I was asked just to come in and kind of give you that big view. Uh, what are the chief uh, ways that you advertise for? What, we, I know that it passes like some school administration type magazines or? Yeah, we advertise right now. We do um, multiple online sites. We do the usual school springs. We go after, um, if you give me one second, I have them here. I can pull sure. out some of the advertisements. National School Development Council, we do, we have a large footprint. So right now we cover six states. When we send an e, we, we work with Connect Ed. I mean, Constant Contact. That was my old district, it slips, <laughs> Connect Ed. No, we work with Constant Contact. So when we send an email blast out, it'll go to, we're just shy of 300 affiliates. They get it from superintendents. We have separate groupings for special ed directors, everybody. So we'll hit all our affiliates, we send out an email blast will hit almost, <laughs> probably close to 10,000 people, as well as selected leadership profession. We do school spring, top schools, AASA, electronic outreach, we hit our website, and we, we don't just post once, we'll keep sending reminders. So if you, this, we get it out right away, then it'll go back again, we, we time it out. So like every 10 days we put it out, we put it in our current, which is our, um, newsletter we send out. So we, we kind of go regional, national, state levels. 
Thank you. That was my question. He took my question. <laughs> I have, I think I have an, hopefully I have an easy one. Um, you threw out the number 500 applications, what? but yeah. I'm, in a real world scenario, what is a typical number of applicants for a director of student services position? I will tell you, Newburyport will be very, very attractive. So on an average, if we, we do well if, I'm trying to think, we, we just ran one out in Webster, and that's a small town, and we still managed to pull in 15, and you're in the game early right now, so I give you all my hat off, get out there early and often, but you're early enough, and again, I think you have a community here that would be attractive to um, many people in the area, and the other piece is that we get calls, so I'm fresh out of the ranks, someone will see this, they'll call me. Uh, we've been known to call people and say, you know what, this would be a perfect fit, maybe you should go throw the application in. So we get back and forth too. So people will see this, reach out to us, and say, you know, gee, Dave, what do you think? I'll be like, it's a great time, go for it. You know, so it, I would, shy of 20 ballpark. maybe, okay. ballpark. I so think not 500. No, not 500. I just, <laughs> okay. because I just want you to know we wouldn't screen 500. That's yeah. a big screening committee yeah. job. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no, that's helpful. Yep. And this was, this was a tremendously helpful. I just have a much clearer picture of what this process yeah, and as is. As I said, Mike is going to go right into the weeds of it all and walk you through step by step. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, so just a clarification on a point you yep. indicated at the end. So our role as a school committee is yet to be determined through this process in terms of our involvement in the final selection. Is that true? Uh, no. Not, not at this point. Right. right. Uh, okay. Yeah. So what is our role in the final selection? So I think the, the final selection would be similar to um, I would similar to the assistant superintendent position where I make a recommendation but school committee role is being part of having a liaison on the screening committees and being involved throughout but the decision of uh, of this director would come out of obviously my office mm -hmm. and then we would mm -hmm. that. correct okay yep. thank you um, I also had a question about the timeline that was presented, and mm. I, I think you said Mike's going to talk about this in more detail. Yes. But my um, question was that the letter, the advertisement, and the job description that would be posted is coming out before the the community focus groups, and I I just I have a question about that that order of operations. Right by design. So when the application letter goes out, it's not it will not have the detail that your focus groups, it literally is, if, and I would always recommend if you go on our website, you can see previous searches, you'll see it all there. It really is just, it's, a, it's about a page, page and a half that says the town of Newburyport is looking for a special ed director, and it highlights what this community and district is all about. So, and then the community work we want to advertise for you, so it's out there at least six weeks. While that's happening, the focus groups are going on, everything else, it's not a, there's not isolated pieces. Once it starts, it starts. So next thing you'll have your focus groups. Shortly after you put out your application, you'll have your focus groups. The candidate profile is a different document. It could be several pages. And it, and it lists right in, you'll see, um, top three qualities, must be X, and then all the comments go underneath it. Third piece, boom, what, all the comments come under it. And your survey's running. So you're pulling in all this data. If we waited to do that and advertise, you'd be a month and a half into the process. Mm -hmm. So while your advertisement's out, then the community comes together, the staff, the t everybody, and builds the profile. Mm -hmm. That's why you'll see the, the lag time between application and screening committee. That gives everybody time to get that work done. What, what would be the downside of, of putting in the job description the competencies and qualifications that our community is looking for? Actually, you will, there's a place for us, you can put a small blurb of that 
but the again the candidate profile is a different document altogether it's pretty it it then guides your search committee because you're gonna have to develop questions mm -hmm. so if you see in the collection of data and voices that these three buckets pop up then you want to guide your questioning around those three major buckets and how people responded to them in the focus <coughs> groups mm -hmm. okay Thank you. Yep. That's not a strange question. We get that a lot in the timeline. Do we have any other questions? Superintendent, anything? No, I'm um, looking forward. To, uh, as we said, I think um, to really do a comprehensive search, put the time and effort into this position, um, and I think it will pay off in the long run. Yeah. <coughs> I had one just clarification. Yep. Um, so we will have a chance to review the advertisement before it goes you out. You review everything. We mm -hmm. don't put anything forward okay. until it is approved by the committee. Yes, you'll get to see. You, you'll actually have bits and pieces. We'll send you a draft <laughs> of it, and you'll see, like, giant blank pieces. Okay. That's where you would put your accomplishments. That's where you would put student recognition, the awards, and you build it into the letter. We'll give you a, a rough template about anything we could pull off, like, you know, real estate web, about Newburyport, but then it's up to the committee to put in those other pieces. Even with regards to the, as I said, the candidate profile, everything is approved by the committee before we <coughs> release it. Okay. If, if I could just ask you to clarify, because we're talking about two different committees. Are you talking about the school committee or the screening committee? Okay. School committee approves the documents. Screening committee yeah. does all the, the work. And again, we've had you, a school committee member usually on a screening mm -hmm. committee. That was one of the questions another team had. Can they be on it? Yes, you just can't have a quorum. Okay, any other questions? Thanks so much for No, I appreciate in. that. Thank you. Thank and again, you. Be, we, we appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right. So next up, um, we're going to be filling a vacancy on the Whittier School Committee. We have two applicants who have joined us tonight. Thank you for coming, Ms. Holliday and Mr. Spaulding back there. I'll just explain the, the process. Um, each, each applicant is going to um, come up and have five minutes to um, share with us their qualifications and interest in the position. We'll take some time to ask any questions that um, committee members have. And um, after that, we will take a vote. So um, unless there are any objections, I think we'll have um, Ms. Holliday first, just because that's alphabetical. Is that okay with everyone? So you can come on up to the podium. Good evening. Nice to be back here, hey. Superintendent, Vice Chair, Hall, members of the school committee. Nice to be here to talk with you. Uh, I saw that the school committee for Whittier, the position was opened and uh, having had to fill this position as a member of this committee for uh, several times over the course of many years, uh, I decided that it made sense for me to step up and put my uh, resume in, uh, especially since it's not a campaign. You don't have to hire a committee. You don't have to have signs. You don't have to do all of that, which I've uh, done a lot of that in the past. But um, for those of you who don't know, I hold a master's in speech and language pathology, I hold a master's in education, a combination of clinical administration and a law degree. And when I was going to law school, I worked at Middlesex Community College where I worked with at least five Vogue Tech schools and had become a real advocate for Vogue Tech schools. I've seen over the years these programs really evolve uh, to provide a wide range of needs that support students. We at Whittier, at Whittier, that's a 50-year-old program. Uh, they have worked to evolve over the years, eliminating programs like fashion design and adding advanced manufacturing. They uh, work with uh, the state on workforce training grants and with uh, equipment grants, have been able to develop a dental assisting program and more. Um, they really understand that the importance of the evolution of 
um, programs that support kids that meet the needs of our current workforce. Uh, I took a tour on Tuesday with Superintendent Lynch and had an opportunity to see no, number one, the condition of the school today, 50 years later, as well as the new <coughs> programs they've initiated. I think one of the biggest challenges for the 11 communities that are part of Whittier, this is a contract that was developed, a compact back in the 60s, and I understand Mayor Fiorentini from Haverhill took it all the way to the um, a highest court in Massachusetts to find out if people could get out of this, and we can't. We're locked into this contract with the state. Um, the problem is, is that when we were in this situation, when I first took office as mayor uh, and working with the Mass School Building Authority, we were able to be the first community to bring two schools into the program, the Bresnahan and Knockmullen, and the Brown, actually. So we took care of four schools. Um, this is a massive, massive program and ask of the communities. Um, having worked with the School Building Authority and I had an opportunity to speak to Senator Tarr on Friday and said, this isn't one community. This isn't just Newburyport where we got 56 and 58% reimbursement. The Whittier needs a lot more reimbursement than that. As they begin going out and completing the schematic design, we should have final numbers next week. It's a concern to all the communities right now with all the needs, as your money's going away, where are we, how are we gonna pay for this capital project? So I believe I have a good expertise and background with working with the School Building Authority. I'm, uh, as I said, a huge champion of uh, Vogue Tech Schools and would like the opportunity to represent Newburyport on the committee. Great. You have a minute and a half left. Is there anything else you'd like to add? They serve great lunches at the Poet. <laughs> um, the Culinary Arts Program is fabulous, and I would, you know, that's expanding also. Um, but I, they also, I think another thing, thank you, I think another thing that's important to remember about Whittier, it's not just a day school. They have night programs also, so they're doing nursing programs. They're really trying to expand and meet the needs of our region. I think there's opportunities here for us to do greater partnerships, and I also think we need to recognize how much higher ed costs today. I am just so grateful that uh, my kids are out of college and I only have about five grand left in my loans to pay off, but you know, we, it's really hard right now. And if we can provide an opportunity to have another pathway, an alternative for our students in order to, um, and many other students do go to college. They become plumbers and then they go on to uh, Northern Essex and get a business degree. Um, have anybody tried to get a plumber or a plasterer or an electrician <laughs> lately? Um, these, are, these are real, real needs and they certainly pay um, very well. So again, I mean these are programs that I would really like to support and hopefully can begin to um, help advance some of the changes that need to in advance and uh, capital needs that have to happen in this building to meet the needs of our students. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. Uh, questions for Ms. Holliday? Yeah, Mr. Callahan. Hello. <laughs> I want to say it was kind of funny, this dynamic, because it's not me asking you for votes. <laughs> <laughs> um, your qualifications, obviously, I know them, haven't worked with you for years. I guess my main question is I don't recall, and I could be wrong, but I don't recall since I've been here six years having seen the rep more than this night. Like, they never really came back here. Right, Murphy, yeah. And had like a, I don't know, up to date presentation or something. I mean, the person who gets this, I would love to see that happen at the very least in FinCom because it's all going to come down to budget, right. really. Um, and then the vote, as far as I understand it, it was initially only for city councils, but now it's going to be a vote vote so that all the voters in the community That's my understanding. in January. Is that your understanding too, Joe, the end of January? There's going to be a community vote the end of January. January yeah. 23rd. Um, yeah. I don't know how that works. I'm not sure either at elections, this point. But um, I guess the only we only have what is under 20 kids. From 28 now, but the October report will confirm that right now. Right. In terms of that, at the highest, I think 19, 18, we had 37. Right. If I remember. Right. So. Um, so really, if the project gets approved, it ends up being like. $2 million per student is what those kids will cost to send to school based on the $30 million we'd have to spend. 
So that's a tough thing for me, uh, you know, especially if it had been down to the city council who chose not to give us any capital funding at the last vote for it when we've had a hole in the roof of the high school for many, many years. I just, I fear that's why they went to, hey, we're gonna do this vote amongst all the voters instead of the city councils in each community. So I guess my question is, how do we, if that project passes, likely with the majority of voters in Haverhill being the, the push, how does the city of Newburyport absorb a million dollars a year without losing something in the district budget? Well, I think that's our job is to be able to advocate for increased uh, mass school building th authority reimbursement because it is hard. I mean, we have a lot of needs within our district, and <coughs> you know how hard I fought for our our district over the years in terms of this not only the school building projects, but in terms of raising our operating budget. So um, we, they've also been doing a fairly decent job with grants, but they've been so specific to equipment. I think that there's got to be other ways that we can do this. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a remarkable school. If you listen to some of the stories of students who have graduated from there and what they have accomplished and what they're doing. So I hope we can find a way to make this work without uh, killing our operational budget for the schools and also on, uh, you know, not the backs of the taxpayers, because we're going to be asking them for more things too down the road. I mean, we've got youth services, we've got a fire station, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So there's got to be a balance there. I know with talking to the superintendent, she was also saying that there's concerns from some of the other communities too, that they don't want them to take any more of their students because of the per um, cost per student and that they can't afford to lose any more students. I think we're probably the only school districts that's showing a positive increase over looking at enrollment uh, over time too. So that's a, that's a problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep, Ms. Walker. Thank you, uh, Donna Holiday, for your um, presentation and for your application. Um, just a question on, to follow up on a point that Brian mentioned, what do you see the board rep's um, role in, commu in communicating to the Newburyport community decision makers? Um, how, do you, how do you see doing that in an effective way? For example, uh, Brian alluded to, we don't really see the rep very often at the school committee, the city council, but also the community at large. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's really important to communicate, especially if we're looking at you know, the potential of this capital project, you know, hitting uh, for a vote. Uh, part of what we did as a school building committee for the city uh, was to be able to communicate on a regular basis about what was going on with the projects. And I think that's the same thing that needs to happen here. Um, I'm very open to options, uh, what people think it makes sense in terms of communicating information. Uh, I think they try every year in November to do open houses. I would uh, uh, typically the first week in, week in uh, November and would encourage everybody to go and take a walk through Whittier to really see the school, see the programs, and to take a look at the condition of some of their um, facilities, like their water sewer, particularly their sewer plant. Is, uh, reminds me of what I saw in 09 in our sewer plant. Um, but. You know, there, there's just a lot of um, information and in how much the community wants to hear. You know, do we do a little section off of school committee notes in terms of an uh, update on Whittier mm -hmm. um, once a month or something? I mean, I'm certainly there's uh, many ways that we can do that, a Facebook page, building on some of the work that they're doing uh, at Whittier also. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question about um, as I'm sure you're aware, there's only six months left on this term. I'm not looking for a firm commitment, but just would you be receptive to being reappointed for a three-year term at that Otherwise, time? Otherwise, I wouldn't have stepped up. Okay, just, sure. uh, I'll be asking Mr. Spaulding the same question. Just, sure. thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, Mr. Spaulding. Joe Spaulding, 6 Bayberry Road, been a new report resident for 69 in years and six months and still going strong here. <laughs> um, been on the Whittier school, school Council for five years and I'm going back on in a couple weeks. Uh, been a business owner in the report for 40 years, so I understand how Whittier works as far as their business school goes. Um, I work well with all the staff there, have a good relationship with them. 
I've got a mutual respect for them and they have the mutual respect for me. A uh, couple of things. Uh, I'd like to get, there's only 29 roughly right now students from Newbyport that go to the school. I'd like to work together to get this, you know, this everybody, or both committees to get together and bring, uh, bring up the, you know, get more children, the students interested in going. I think because a lot of them, everybody doesn't go to college. And if you see now with the student, um, the college, student loans, all the issues that's going on, people think, go to college, make a lot of money, pay the loan off and be happy the rest of their lives. Well, it doesn't work that way as we know. So, um, without <coughs> taking away from the report, I'd like to, you know, see if we can get, you know, meeting people as parents and everything, and get them, you know, sh at least show them what it's about. I think that's one thing enough. And the other thing is the, uh, I'd like to address would be um, appropriation, why Newbyport pays so much more money than the other schools do, other cities and towns. Um, that's something you're gonna have to work together with through the state. Uh, the other, uh, another one of the things is the, um, a lot of the students that graduate and have their own business, a lot of them come back and do it. Every once a month they do a, um, seminar and teach, you know, so we can do things, how we, you know, if you get things done. Um, what else we got here? Like, like, like Ms. Dawn, Ms. Dawn Holiday said that the school building, it's gonna be, it's a big issue. It's gonna be a lot of, a lot of pushing and shoving and both ways, but getting that done, it's 50 year old building, so it's gonna need a lot, needs a lot of work now, and a lot of issues there, so. Uh, this is my second application for this position, I'll be dedicated to the position I plan on staying as long as I can move and get up and go to the meeting, so. Questions? You all set? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so I think you already answered my question about you're, you'd be interested in being reappointed in yes. six months? Yes, yeah. Okay, yep. great. Um, yep. Can you say a little bit more about your involvement on the Whittier Student Council? Is that Student, what you uh, yeah. called School it? Yeah, School Council. Just Oh, it's school yeah. council, okay. Uh, basically, they meet um, once a month, and they have representative teachers, a lot of teachers there, a lot of students. You know, I try to get, Excuse me. one issue I've pushed, it, and it's starting to work, is I want every class represented there. They just go over things, what's going on, what the, you know, what parents are asking, and want to know what's going on, they go back and tell their parents. So it's a real good, it's a really sharp children, students there. Uh, they're really into it, and I enjoy I enjoy being there with them. And, uh. Thank you, um, Mr. Menon. Yeah, um, Joe, you've been involved with Whittier for for five years, and yes. probably longer yep. than that. And I just wondered if you could talk about things that you have seen changing, because I know that that Whittier is in transition. There are bringing new things on, but I just wondered if, if, what have you seen in the last five years that you would see as constructive changes in the curriculums and the offerings? I just, I think um, um, a better communication has been going on over the last few years between cities, towns, and, and the school itself, um, which is important. Because you can't, you're not, you know, it's going to be a team effort, to, especially, like I say, it was a $245 million building they're talking about. And I'm um, about to change the subject, but they, today on Whittier, they ha on their website, they had quite a, quite a thing. They're going to tell what, when the meetings are, what cities and towns are going to have their meetings, and they're going to do presentations. So there's going to be, I think, up here one, uh, next couple, next few months, they're going to have a meeting here for new report residents. Um, so, and it's a good thing, it's like they, I've seen them every, every day it seems like they're putting some kind of a new press release out and they, they're getting more and more. And when I first started, I didn't really see that, but I've noticed that over the last couple of years. So I think that's important, communications, you know, no secrets, no nothing, this is what's gotta be done. Especially if you wanna sell a building to, you know, people in, in tough economic times. So it's gonna be a team effort. And I know it, I mean, I know it needs it. I've walked around up there and there's some issues that I'm not gonna exp talk about, but there's issues there. And I don't know, you know, how they keep going with the way they are. And they get some, they've got, one of the meetings, I think it was last year, they had uh, the, the uh, previous, one of the uh, administrators that does the in, uh, new enrollments. She says, I got, you know, we did a presentation. She says, I got, what she say, 1,500 applications. I gotta go through the summer. I says, you're gonna sleep at all? You're gonna be, you know, what? <laughs> 1,500 of them. I said, they don't have the room. 
right now. They just don't have the room. And it, it's too bad because, you know, if they choose to go there, then we should provide place, a room for, you know, is it, but it's not gonna happen unless it's a team effort. And see, that's, again, see, over the years, I've seen people get more and more involved. Mm -hmm. and, um, <coughs> thank you. Yeah. Ms. Walker? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Mr. Spalding, for your presentation, for your application and your and your presentation tonight. Just uh, another follow-up question related to what I asked uh, Ms. Holiday, which, how do you see um, your role in helping with communications around between uh, your your position and the board, and also school committee, the broader community of Newburyport? Do you have any ideas on how to improve those communications? What I'm doing right now, talking face to face. I don't like emails, I don't like Facebook, I don't like cell phones, I like to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> that way we can always tell, we're telling the truth to each other, you know, and that's just, I don't have a problem going to some place anytime mm -hmm. and talking to people. You know, I, that's just, I don't know, the old school, I guess, and that's from the old days. I don't, you know, everybody's emails and all this stuff. Well, I don't have a cell phone, I don't have, I use somebody else's email, so if you want to call my house, I'll come up and visit you and go from there. And, but, um, Thank you. Um, I think if you got the job, I think you'd have to have your own email for <laughs> public records laws. You'd probably have to have your own email if you got on for public records. Well, well, I'll, work. Yeah. I'll get my teacher. Um, well, I told them up the school, I said, they might have to if, you know, yeah. go to the class. Up here. And the teacher said, no, we don't want you in the class. But, um, I just got a question. You mentioned capacity and how students are turned away because there's not enough room. Mm -hmm. How does that work? How do they, um, what is the word I'm trying to think of? How do they, uh, what am I trying to say? Yeah. How do they um, <laughs> allot? spaces oh. per community so it, i believe if, if i believe the majority are from haverhill and then 10 kids from newburyport want to go and 10 kids from haverhill want to go do they say sorry you already have all those kids i believe i'm the, that it's it's you know per, per you know each person has their own interview when they go they very very particular who they pick and choose you know so you it's really like private att school. attendance and other you know other things yeah. so i mean if if just because you, you know, you say we'll take ten here, five here. I believe it's just based on that. I could find that out for you and Mr. stop Golden. by and let you know. Yeah. You the, uh, Steve Cole has yeah, a historic reference. Absolutely. So the <laughs> the uh, demographic has changed. For instance, back in the seventies, uh, there was as many as one hundred twenty-five Newburyport students going to Whittier Tech. Uh, I remember the late Frank Kane telling mm -hmm. me about mm -hmm. that. And uh, so I think it's really the demand. And what I found interesting recently is when we sat in on the first day for teachers presentation, uh, the keynote speaker, Rick, warmly mentioned the importance of skills and careers in this area. And I think it's really incumbent on us to recognize the, that importance and try to get those numbers up. So I think if the demand goes up, maybe the cost goes down, especially if you're gonna expand and have more room for students. I only mention it because with the district, if 150 kids showed up on one day, they all come to school. We can't turn them away mm -hmm. and say there's no space in the building. So it's, right. it's a whole different model. It's not like that yeah. for them. I know, yeah. I know when she was, she was talking about it, it was kind of bothering her that she even had to say no to anybody. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it was like, you know, so that's, that's the people, that's the nice people they've got work up there in a school, dedicated. It's not a pay, pay, it's not just a job to them, it comes out of their hearts. And I get, that's why I get along with them and they're nice, you know. But. Oh, Ms. Higgins, uh, what is it that you primarily want to accomplish in this role? What do you want to accomplish in this role? I'd like, two of the things, like I said, would be to um, get the appropriations equal. I don't think it's fair, you know. And I think that might be a deterrent why we're, you know, we're not as a, as a new report group pushing to get more to report students to go there, part of the reason. I think just, and I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying. And the other thing was um, like the appropriation, the appropriation, you know, like I said, why, why do we, you know, why does one city in town have to pay more? And it's not even, I don't think, I think it's close. It's quite a, quite a difference. It's not a few thousand, I think it's more than three or four or five thousand dollars difference. So, and like the two things, like <coughs> take care of the appropriation and try to get more students to go. Try. All you can do is, you know, take them and say, you know, come up, look at the, see what we got, what they offer. And they love to do that up there. So it's a, you know. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? 
Thank you, Mr. Spaulding. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Do we still have the Knox students <coughs> go and tour Whittier? Mm -hmm. That's so that is something that happens. Yes. Um, in the fall or uh, around so. when they would be fall. applying. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So unless there were any other um, questions or discussion, we're going to do a roll call vote here. Yes. I actually have a statement I'd like to make on behalf of one of the candidates. Go ahead. First of all, we're fortunate to have two well-qualified candidates in attendance this evening. I'm speaking on behalf of Mr. Joseph Spaulding's appointment to the Whittier Regional Vocational Technical High School School Committee. During the 2017-2018 school year, Mr. Spaulding came before the New Report School Committee seeking to replace the late F. Nelson Burns II, but was not successful. I supported Mr. Spaulding then, and I do the same this evening. Besides my knowledge and experience with Mr. Spaulding's service and commitment to the New Report community, it is important to know that he has been an active member of the Whittier School Student Council since the 2017-2018 school year and has maintained perfect attendance while in that role. This allows Mr. Spaulding to be aware of the issues impacting Whittier, the students, the staff, as well as the communities that are being served. When Whittier began in 1973, it was not uncommon for 125 or more New Report students to attend. Today, there are fewer students attending, largely due to a changing demographic. While there may be fewer New Report students going to Whittier, there are more people in our area who want a quality of life that requires the knowledge, skills of licensed trades people. Consequently, there are more opportunities for young people to receive knowledge, skills, and licensure needed to begin a rewarding career in one of the many fields that Whittier Tech provides training, learning, and development in. As I mentioned, first day for teachers, keynote speaker Rick Warmerly noted the importance of these skills and careers. Mr. Spaulding understands that changing demographic. From his school council experience, he has learned what is needed and can be delivered to the 11 member communities. He has been present, focused, diligent, and collaborative with his work on the school council. I ask members of the committee to join me in voting for Mr. Joseph Spaulding as the next new report representative to the Whittier Tech School Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Did anyone else wish to speak? Mr. Menon. Yeah, I, um, it's always challenging when you have two very highly qualified candidates. Um, both candidates raised the issue that I have some concerns about, as did Mr. Callahan, which is the potential expenses coming up of doing the right thing by Whittier and the building in the community. And m my decision to support um, Donna Holiday is because I know that she has extensive grant writing experience. And I know that Whittier has, has looked for grants for equipment. This is a different kind of type of grant writing. I know she's got that experience. And I would like to make sure that Whittier has somebody who is familiar with that uh, process and has been creative and has used grants, but has also written them. And I say that as a, as a grant writer myself. Um, so that is w one of my concerns, and I, and I see, I see um, Ms. Holiday as being able to address that need right from the get-go. Would anyone else like to speak? Um, Mr. Callahan. Oh, you can go, Joe. Okay. Um, I just want to follow up on those comments and, and say that um, I absolutely appreciate both candidates' passion and interest in this. Um, I would also like to say that Mr. Spaulding, it's um, amazing the amount of um, commitment he has put to this particular, um, to the school and um, the service he's provided in that way. Um, I am personally leaning towards candidate Holiday, um, in particular because of the challenges that we will be facing over the next few years related to the uh, required expansion of the school. So I do think that that particular skill set um, that she brings and experience and connections um, at the state level is going to benefit um, our district, but I, I just want to say that I, I really value Mr. Spalding's service to our community. 
Thank you. Mr. Callahan. Uh, I have uh, similar feelings that uh, Ms. Walker and Mr. Menon have uh, regarding Mr. Spaulding's commitment in his school council and with Ms. Holliday, who I've obviously known for a while since she was mayor and uh, head of this committee, uh, and her experience with grant writing and so forth. Uh, the one opinion I do have is that it would be best off for the whole city if both of them remained as part of the Whittier reps for the city of Newburyport. So I think it would be great if Mr. Spalding remained on the school council there and Ms. Holliday um, took over the school committee um, position, and that would <coughs> be my vote. Okay. Are, are we all set then? So, um, Ms. Yell, this will be a, a roll call, and you'll say the name of your preferred candidate. Sarah Hall. Donna Holliday. Bruce Menon. Donna Holliday. Steve Cole. Joseph Spaulding. Brian Callahan. Donna Holliday. Juliet Walker. Donna Holliday. Brianna Higgins. Joe Spaulding. And Mayor Ridden is out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the appointment goes to Donna Holiday. Thank you both very much for coming in today. So, Superintendent, you'll be reaching out to Superintendent Lynch mm -hmm. with the news, and then you can be in touch with Ms. Holiday from here? Yes. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming in, and congratulations. All right, next up we have the Special Education Program Overview. Um, should Deb come right up? Or yeah, Deb, yep, Deb can come on up. <coughs> so we have um, Ms. Deb O'Connor, who is filling in right now as our Director of Student Services, and again, again um, but the, the good news is that... I'm doing it, though, as, as an emeritus. <laughs> I think the good news for the district is... Um, Deb's qualifications are unmatched, so she's going to be with us throughout the entire year, which then gives the community, uh, school committee time to really get the, um, the next person, as um, Dr. Druzy was talking about, that's going to be a right fit. So we're in great hands um, with Ms. O'Connor and her experience. Um, so she's going to go um, kind of give an overview of the programming and then just touch base on some of the other uh, work we're doing with inclusion and then also co-teaching and, and all of that. It's the <laughs> Ms. O'Connor show right now. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I don't usually toot my own horn, but uh, I feel the need, because I know some of you know me in different ways, so I feel the need to, to assure you as a committee that uh, I'm very qualified for the position that I've stepped into. Um, I am retired special education administrator. I was the administrator for 14 years in Beverly, the special ed administrator. That's how I knew him. <laughs> so that's why and, I- And you're I, willing to admit that. I, I am willing to great. admit that, that, that absolutely. Uh, I also um, have taught at the college level. I followed student teachers. I I've followed uh, candidates who want to be administrators. In fact, the reason why I, I reconnected with Sean was that I was here following a reading student teacher uh, for uh, Endicott College. So I have worked for Endicott, I have worked for AIC, I have worked for Simmons. Uh, I have my CAGS in leadership in, in special education. I taught for 24 years. Uh, so I've been in a residential school. So I come with a, a a plethora of different experiences and a lot of knowledge about special ed. I also come with a passion about special ed. And uh, I never <laughs> thought I would be standing in this position again, but uh, I've been working as a consultant for, for the district and working with different uh, components. Uh, I became very fond of the teachers, the families, uh, the students, and um, I was willing to step in to help during during this uh, change in administration. So I thought it was kind of important for me to just explain to you who I am, and I'm not just somebody who's been around. 
uh, <laughs> in variety of positions. So the thing I'm not as good at is the, the, all this stuff, so. Okay. <laughs> Lisa, it won't work. <laughs> Well, if you were a tech director, it would be a problem. <laughs> yeah, don't hire me as a tech person, please. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. So I, what I'm going to do is just go through the state of special education yeah. uh, right now so that you know where the district is uh, as far as special education goes uh, right now. So um, let's start with that. Okay, so special education by the numbers here in, in um, Newburyport. Uh, we currently have 471 students on an IEP. That may be that they're just dropping in, uh, they're preschoolers and they're getting speech therapy. Or they could be very involved and they're 18 to 22 and they're in the graduate program. Um, we have 38 special education teachers as well as 12 related service providers. And by related service providers, I mean occupational therapists, speech and language pathologists, um, those, those kind of folks. Uh, I do believe we have one physical therapist that does all the, the students in our district. We have uh, currently 56 instructional assistants that work with our special educators and our related service providers to ensure that the kids are fully included as much as possible in their in their classes. Uh, we also have, and I think this is a really important piece, uh, I've been very impressed, you know, having come in, in a lot of different districts, I've been very impressed uh, that there's 26 providers for the social emotional. We have a, a, a variety of social workers, BCBAs, um, school adjustment counselors. So, I mean, it, it, we're really, we have some really good programs, the Bright program. So we've, we've done some really good work with the social emotional. And I think right now after the pandemic, that's huge and it's an important component. Okay. So to tell you, one of the reasons why I really wanted to honor my, my team over there is because when I walked in, we were all like, okay, we're, I'm brand new here in this role, even though I've been in the district. And so there was a lot of work to be done this summer and they stepped up and helped me out. So I just wanted to kind of fill you in into what we did during the summer. Uh, we had to go and make sure that all our IEPs all 470 were in compliance and scheduled with services. Uh, we met consistently with parents and outside providers to amend services, review issues around regression, or oversight around the summer school program. Uh, we reviewed IEPs, worked with families to get them to sign off on IEPs. Um, we worked with the building in administrators to interview and hire teachers, IAs, related service providers. Uh, we are still currently looking to hire a special ed, uh, severe special needs teacher at the Molin. Um, the candidate that we had fell through and so we are uh, working really hard uh, with that piece. And um, we just hired two BCBAs, so now in three weeks we will have all our BCBAs on, on, um, in district, so that's good. Um, we plan um, all the initiatives and the priorities. If you come and look at my board, we've got a list of all the things and all the procedures that we're, we really want to put in place. Uh, we're preparing for the DESE tiered focus monitoring. I've been doing a lot of the self-assessment components, which is looking at records and looking at processes and procedures and our manuals and all our documents. Um, this is another big piece that we're um, doing is in September of 2024, the state is going to new IMP. So we are implementing the brand. I actually helped Beverly implement the 2002 uh, IEP, so now I'm going to be helping Newburyport implement the 2024 uh, <coughs> plan. Uh, and again, we had to arrange and budget for all the contracted services and work with Phil. Um, so, any questions about any of the uh, things that we had to do to prepare? So, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some of our programs. Um, one of the things when I started here in 2019, uh, 
right, right before the pandemic <laughs> and everything shut down. And I was working at that time with Sean and Andy Wolf about looking to set up a therapeutic learning center at the high school. And we were really thinking about um, the kiddos that needed to have credit recovery. Little did we know what was ahead and little did we know that this would be such an important thing. And since that time, we've put in several therapeutic learning centers throughout the district. So I'm going to just go over a little bit about. The TLC is designed to create an environment where each student's strengths and weaknesses are supported in ways that lead to academic emotional growth. Program staff develop a therapeutic alliance with families because it's an important piece. And then we actually teach the skills that kids need to be able to advocate for themselves, to be able to, to feel good about their, their position in the school and in the community. Uh, it's comprehensive, it's evidence-based. Uh, we try to do as much full inclusion as we can. Uh, we try not to pull kids back unless, for, you know, we have some kiddos that really, they're so anxious that they do better in a small, quiet environment. So we try to you know, work with them and work with the families because our, our goal is to keep them in school. Our goal is one of the hardest things as a teacher is when the kiddos really just can't get themselves to school. That, it's heartbreaking. It's, it, so it's like we want them to come. We want to work with them. We want to nurture them and get them to a place where they're starting to feel good about themselves in school. Uh, we use positive behavior plans, which will go with the new IEP very well because they're focusing on all positive information. Uh, we have counseling and consultation right within our programs. And um, so far, we now have one, I think two at the Bresnahan. We have one uh, at the middle school and one at the high school, as well as we have the Bright program. And what's that other program, Elise, that we have? We have the. We call it Bright now. Oh, it is Bright. Okay, so they're calling it now. So we have a non special ed therapeutic program and a special ed therapeutic program. So it's a continuum. It's a continuum of services. And Tim Potts works very, very closely with the staff. Uh, he is the mental health person. So, and it's, it's I, kids are doing far better. And would you agree that the, it, this has been a successful thing going forward? Um, quick a question here for yeah, Ms. Higgins. I'm sorry. Um, you might not know the exact numbers, but in general, what percentage of um, kids with emotional impairment are in full inclusion versus sub-separate classrooms? Uh, I would say it's a pretty small percentage. Uh, I could definitely get you the exact because I have the, the whole <laughs> list and I've been collecting everything for Desi, so <laughs> I'm getting really good with the data. So uh, I could get you the very specifics, but I, I believe there are very few students that don't go out and, and be fully included. Am I correct? They're all pretty much in classes at least 50% of the time. Okay if Great. not hopefully more. So then we did the language-based class. Uh, and this was kind of, I was consulting on this. So Nancy Koch and I really kind of talked a lot about language-based programming. Uh, I had, being in Beverly, I was next door to Landmark. As you can imagine, people would move from Germany and come buy homes on the ocean and then want us to pay for, for Landmark. So it was really important that we actually created competitive, strong programs. We partnered with Landmark, and that is something that we talked to Sean about, Nancy and I, we brought it to the district. Uh, we have a tiered program with the language base, which basically means we have two groups of language-based kiddos and one group needs one kind of intervention and the other group needs the, uh, another kind of intervention. So we've got the kids who really need to break the code to really start reading to learn. And then we have the 
another group that's it's more metacognitive. They need a lot of metacognitive strategies. They need more speech and language, and their their language disabilities are more global. So that's why we tiered it tier one and tier two. So we call it skills based instruction and language based instruction. But they're all based on the language based, and they're all in Larson's from Landmark comes and works with us, works with the administration, and works with the teachers as well. Um, the teachers find it very, it's professionally, you know, uh, it, it, it professionally makes them feel good about what they're doing, it uh, validates their work, and the kids really benefit, and uh, I've seen some real successes with these. So I'm just going to quickly tell you the goal, what the language based is, it's to develop language and literacy skills. Um, it's all based on the science of reading. It's all based on what we've learned. And it's, it's interesting because when I first started, and I've been doing this for 46 years, so when I first started, Orton Gillingham was absolutely the Cadillac version of what would be best for teaching reading. And then we got away from it, and we did the inventive spelling and all this other crazy stuff, which I apologize to lots of students I had. And now we now know that we're going back to the basics, and Orton Gillingham is, in fact, still the Cadillac or the Tesla at this time. So um, we're really utilizing Orton Gillingham. We're training our staff so that they're able to understand the methodology, because Wilson was a program that was based on Orton Gillingham. <laughs> Wilson was a woman who was really smart and marketed and really smart and made it teacher friendly. Uh, Orton Gillingham is understanding the principles and, and, and the strategies behind it and really allowing the teachers to use creativity and to use their own, uh, what they know about teaching and learning. So it's great. And we're training a lot of staff in that. So. Kudos to Duke Report for being willing to do that. Yes, Brianna? One more question. Um, the core curriculum you have mentioned here, is that referring to Orton Gillingham or is there another core curriculum? Okay, so with the core curriculum, they use the, the general curriculum that is in okay. like the fourth grade classes in a fourth grade class. But what Ann does is she works with the staff, she works with the general ed staff as well. So they use the methodologies but they teach the same content and our teachers go in and they work with yeah. Uh, the general ed teacher, so you've got the best of both worlds. Okay. And um, so that's how it kind of works. Any other questions about the language base? Perfect. Okay. The independent development center. Because I got to tell you, I've heard about IDC forever. I just found out what it meant. So it's the independent developmental uh, center, and the students in these programs have cognitive disabilities. They have physical challenges, uh, often complex medical conditions, and multiple disabilities. Uh, we have them from age three. We actually start hearing about them from EI probably at about two, two and a half. So we have them from age three until they're 22. And I think that the important piece to remember with these kids is the chances are they're going to be with us till they're 22. Uh, these, are, these are the kids where really we need to be very careful about how we plan going forward. So we've been working really hard to vertically align what I mean by vertically aligned is make sure that the preschool is still thinking about what they're going to need in middle school and what they're going to need in high school. And our goal is to make them very successful community members, to feel good about themselves, and to be part of the community uh, and to find skills. One of the things that we did this year is we determined that one of the occupational therapists is now going to actually have the kids from preschool to 22. So she is going to work on activities of daily living, and she's going to create a curriculum that brings the kids forward. I've been talking to Lisa Furlong about developing, I know you have a portrait of a graduate. Well, we're going to do a portrait of these graduates. 
that's kind of on our on our radar so that we know what in fact they need and we can plan accordingly if this pilot works then I would recommend that we actually maybe go to speech and language and do it so uh, this is just a was a kind of an idea of mine that I thought would be helpful to vertically align and make sure all the kids are getting one of the things I'm noticing is at the elementary school and Aaron can attest to this we've got a lot of kids um, we, it's pretty light at the high school at this point. Our graduate program is very light, but can I tell you, we've got a lot of little kids. I want to say there's about nine or ten of them, right? Yeah. And that's from age, you know, two and a half up. So uh, what we thought was going to be three kids in a class turned out to be seven. So um, we need to really plan accordingly. And these kids can be really su successful. They love being in school. They love being part of the community. And it's, research says it's also good for the community and for the other kids to be a part of that. And so I'll just Why don't we, see. I, I make the slides and then I just talk anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Brianna, well, um, do you have all the augmentative communication technology that is needed for the district, or is yes, there anything we, additional? We, we, we consult uh, with an augmentative communication person. Uh, Melanie comes in, she works with our speech and language pathologist, works with our families. She provides consultation to the families as well as the staff, and um, the IAs are trained on the communication devices, uh, and then the speech therapists make sure that the, the devices are working. In some instances, we had to start some kids this summer, and so we had them going to Miracle Farms because we were unable to hire our own speech and language, so we contracted out to get those services in place so that so that one of our students didn't miss a beat, and she started her first grade with, with the augmented that's, communication. That's so just given the number that you mentioned, the growing number at the Bresnahan, we have all the... The tech that's needed. We have all the technology. We also have uh, Tara LeGrow, who we use for assistive technology, and we uh, reach out to her as well. Uh, and she also trains families and trains uh, staff as well, Great. so that we can make sure that we utilize all that. And I, because Lisa is now my my roommate, I keep asking her all kinds of things, even though that's not my strength. So Can I? I'm going to. Oh, just one uh, more question, Dan. Yeah, just oh, to I'm follow sorry. up. Sorry. No, I'm it's sorry. okay. D just to follow up to that. So, uh, with the understanding that many of these, well, that most of these students are, we're assuming they're going to be with us for their, mm -hmm. for their adult, their young, their youth, age mm -hmm. three to 22. Um, are you also anticipating future budgetary needs as they get into the older grades? Um, any specialized needs that we don't have now, whether it's you know space needs or um, those kind of things, as we can start to anticipate what those those might be. Yeah. Okay. So that's that was all about the vertical alignment. That's why it was so important to me, and that's why I had uh, talked to Sean back a couple years ago, and I said you need to vertically align this. So when they when the kids come in early on, you can have a plan going forward, and uh, you know he knows I've, I've shared with him the trajectory so okay. he knows that yeah they're all little right now but there's a lot of them yeah and our hopes is that we are able to maintain and keep them and and right. educate them right here in their own community I mean that's what parents want that's what the kids want mm -hmm. uh, and you know I mean they go into the community and everybody knows them and right. and so they're they're a part of that community which is really nice uh, so yes, that is part of wanting to vertically align so that we know what's coming up for the high school. Great. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the graduate program is very small right now. I think we've got like three students and one is actually going to be turning 22, I think, in January. Um, these are, for, again, the same kinds of students. They're intellectually handicapped. They've got multiple handicaps. Uh, and they have significant social and communication delays. Uh, but our goal is to get them into the community. They have jobs in the community. One of our students works at Market Basket, and we do job coaching. Uh, one of our students delivers all the mail throughout our district, and 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 is you know. So we try to keep them as part of the community and train them so that they have skills. So when they are you know, 22, and unfortunately, there's not a lot out there after 22. Mm -hmm. It kind of breaks my heart, but um, 
So we want to be able to make sure that those families have at least as much information and opportunities as possible. Um, yeah, and then the other piece too, it's the, the work we've done with our internship programs. Yes. Um, is really going to pay, you know, as we talk about the future planning, it's going to pay off for, for those families and those students. So that's also been a great connection. Mr. Cole? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a couple questions, Deb. So you mentioned that the uh, the uh, graduate program is kind of light. What, 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 what would you say your current capacity is for that program? We could probably have handled Six, with, with the staffing we have right now, it's probably about six students. We've okay. got three. And uh, I um, guess on a national or state, let's start with the state, on a statewide basis, where do you see uh, programming like that? Is it increasing at all? Is it widening? Is it getting stronger? Because you mentioned that when the kids get older or the young people get older, well, I think, right gonna, I think there's going to be, and this is my understanding, and I'm just getting trained in the new, in the new IEP process that's going to be uh, in 2024, but there's going to be a real focus on transition and planning to uh, not only just your, your, your severely you know, disabled students, but also your, your students that have a variety of uh, issues and, and disabilities and how we transition them and how we provide for them so that, that when they turn, you know, they get their graduate degree or whatever, they, they're able to go and, and meet their own um, desires. Is that something that like something like mass rehab could help with? Mass rehab is more like they would help with the kiddos in the graduate program. Right. Yeah. 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 We do. We we have to do referrals. Uh, absolutely. We get all the agencies involved. The problem is now that that there's very little help out there with the agencies. Back in my day when I was teaching, we had a lot more uh, robust services for kids when they turn 22 than we do today. Yeah, I so, guess that's what yeah. I'm getting at. That's yeah, it's, gonna not, a, it's gonna be a problem. Yeah. It's gonna be a problem for the state, it's gonna be a problem for DMH, and yeah. absolutely. All right, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Um, Mr. Callahan, no, no. do you have a question? Not until she's finished with all the slides. Okay. You want me to finish more? Okay. No, I know me, I'm just like running through this. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we thought we invested in other uh, initiatives and um, the Orton Gillingham, which I mentioned before. Currently, there are 11 teachers in this district and uh, you saw there were like 38 special ed teachers. That's a lot of teachers that are currently completing and working on a full two-year training with Orton Gillingham, so they will be fully certified in Orton Gillingham. And again, what Orton Gillingham is, is the science of learning and the five pillars of literacy. Um, it's the Cadillac and Kudos to those teachers because it's an investment. It's a lot of time they've put in summers, they put in nights, they put in weekends. We fund it, but they're, they're the, the people that are going out. And what's really <coughs> nice is they have to have students on a one-to-one. -one. So we have a whole group of kids that are benefiting and getting the, you know, the best one-to-one -one instruction because they have their uh, people come in and, and watch them. And so it, it's really, it's great. The Orton Gillingham is amazing what Newbury Port has been willing to do. It's impressive. Uh, for the co-teaching, uh, this is the second year of this initiative in the Bresnahan. Uh, there has been co-teaching in the district. Uh, there's co-teaching at the high school, there's co-teaching at the middle school, but it hasn't been a systematic initiative, if, if that makes sense. Uh, so what Jamie did is she really sat down and we, we talked through what you needed for co-teaching and when we can train people and what they wanted. We met with the co-teachers, we asked them what kinds of training do you folks want. Last year there was a group that came in and did some uh, overall training around what co-teaching is. But you know, good co-teaching is awesome, but it's like a marriage. You know, the teachers have to kind of learn to work together, uh, negotiate lots of things together, whether it's who's going to grade, but it's, it's a partnership. And so uh, we're really working hard to support these 
co-teachers and support the partnerships so that they feel um, as though they really are invested in this initiative. Uh, I would say about three quarters of the teachers are into the second year. Some of the teachers said to us, that's not for me. So we, we worked around that and we figured it out and we got people who are on board and want to be part of this initiative. But it's really about using, using universal design. It's really promoting the why, the what, the how of learning. It's promoting metacognition. And uh, eventually, if you keep doing it, it, it should just be like, you know, <laughs> riding a bike, you know, you don't even think about it. Um, I know when I was co-teaching at one point, so co-teaching has been popular for quite a while, our goal was to have the special ed director come in and decide which one were my students and which one were the English teacher's students, because that was our goal, was to have it so seamless that all the kids learn from both of us, and that is, that is the goal here um, with co-teaching. And again, the revised IEP for the fall. What's really nice about the uh, new IEP, which I really like, is they're getting rid of all the language. Uh, we, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like I think of it like when I go to the mechanics. I don't want to hear how you're fixing my car. I want to hear that you're going to fix my car and what I can do about it. And so the jargon, and I've talked to a lot of parents, is, can be really overwhelming. It can be really overwhelming. So one of the initiatives at the state level is no more jargon. It's going to be... If we're going to write it in language that teachers understand, that parents understand, and when those kids turn 14, the kids understand. So I'm really kind of excited about that, and it's really forcing us to be more strength-based rather than always spending our time just focusing on what they can't do. Let's promote and, and, and encourage what they can do too, so it's going to be much more of a strength-based kind of thing. And the other piece that's really different is that transition work. Really, when when child turns 14, they get to be part of that IEP. They get to say what they want to do. We get to come up with a plan of how you're going to reach it, and it's going to be part of the IEP going forward. So that's kind of exciting, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, I think it's really exciting. And I think that's it. Any questions? Ms. Higgins, did you have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for this presentation. It was really helpful just to get a full scope of the programming in the district. Really excited about co-teaching. You know, I know it has a lot of benefits for kids that it's really, in, um, it has huge upside. It also is very expensive, right? It's fiscally very expensive. It's a very expensive model um, to, to fund to begin with and then mm -hmm. to sustain. And so mm -hmm. one thing that I'm wondering if um, you're able to look into for the past year and then this year moving forward is what data do we have to determine how effective it is for the students that are in those classes? Is there a way to compare the students in the co-taught classes versus those that were not? You know, over time, how are they doing? I absolutely agree with you, and that was a, a conversation that Jamie and I were having actually the day we were talking about when we were going to go further. And I know we're working with uh, Lisa Marie around the data and uh, you know how the kids are doing on the progress monitoring and stuff. Uh, and we need to kind of look at that and really look at the trajectory because it is not a cheap way of going. <laughs> It's like, it's great, but it's very fiscally high. And, um, a lot of districts don't do it, not because they don't think it's a great thing, but because it, it costs so much. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we are looking at the data. We're going to look at the trajectory, see how these kids are doing, and uh, you know try to make a determination based on not just the feel-good piece. <laughs> the feel-good piece is like we can all give, anecdotally, we can all say great things, but we really need to look at all the, the, the data that's um, coming out of the progress monitoring and compare it, do a compare and contrast. Great. If that's something that you could incorporate maybe into a formative data presentation later this year, just, you know, pulling out a spotlight on the co-taught classrooms, um, you know, the way that you're analyzing it, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking to the assistant you, superintendent. Can, can you help me? You. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the stuff I love, okay? I mean, I, I am here because I really 
do love special education and I love the kids. And when, when all else fails, they're my North Star because this is a hard job. And I understand why you've had a lot of turnover because it is a very hard job. And there is a lot of turnover in a lot of districts. Uh, but Newbury Ports had a lot of SPED directors in a very short time. And when I say I stayed for 14, but I need therapy. <laughs> but I was, <laughs> okay. But I'm somebody that kept saying, next year I'm going to get it right. Next year I'm going to get it right. But the, but the reality is, is that it, it, you're never going to fix everything, but you have to keep going, and you got to have a North Star. And for me, it's been the kids. So, any other questions, Mr. Callahan? I have a couple, please. Um, yeah. You said 471 kids are in IEPs. Correct. That's roughly 20 percent of the student mm -hmm. body. Right? I think it's a teeny bit higher than that. Yeah. So. That's how higher than that state look, average. How, how does that look compared to our 10, what DESE considers our 10 comp communities? How, how do we fare against them? We're high. We're high. Somebody, somebody threw out a number on the internet somewhere, who knows, that we're yeah. almost double the amount of places like Andover or Bedford or some of those. Uh, I, I can certainly look at the DART, which is you know the comparable, and get that information to you. I'd be happy to do that. But I know just from my gut, we're high. Uh, I know the state average is like 17%, I think. Yeah. Uh, it'd be interesting to know yeah. if we are. Erin, you know, Aaron, do you know what Andover another, was? Another town. Andover was high as well. It was high. high. Yeah, and that's some of the things they look at when they do this TFM, the, the tiered focus monitor. They look at you know if we're over identifying kids and and if we're over judging particular areas of kids. Okay. Uh, uh, do you have a, do you want the answer? Oh, you have it. <laughs> so we're at twenty point seven percent. The lowest in our DART is seventeen point seven, okay. and the highest is twenty two. Andover's at 19, so it's not a broad range between 17 and 22, and we're in the middle at 20. What's the lowest? The lowest is 17 point, oh, I'm sorry, 16.9, that's Menden Upton. So it still seems like there's a whole lot of kids. 15% like of a student buy, that's a lot of mm -hmm. kids who need extra help, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you. Um, and the second question I have, the, under the 26 social emotional providers, how many did you say were school adjustment counselors? I'd have to break that out. I just I counted. I thought, you, I thought you said a number. That's why. Oh, I I I I I'm not sure. I I, I would hate to give it exact. I'm not no, sure. No, no, I included the school decimal counselors, the social worker, the uh, BCBAs. I included the the psychologists that see kids. Okay. So I guess my my ask, if mm -hmm. you're comfortable, because when we come to the budget, and Sean wants to hire another school adjustment counselor, and we're all like, sure, you know, if that's what you need. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that's questioned the most by either the community or some city council members, okay. and we're about to potentially change the city council makeup. So if you wouldn't mind explaining what school adjustment counselor actually means so I can refer to this recording when they start asking all these questions <laughs> so it's done correctly. You, you know they're not watching, right? I know, but they all have it on tape. I can send them a link to it. But if you are comfortable with that, I would appreciate well, it. Well, the school adjustment counselor, uh, is their, their role is to meet all students, okay? <laughs> so you do not have to be on an IEP to get uh, services from the school adjustment counselor. It can be as little as a, a quick check-in, and it can be as involved as, as a kiddo that's going through a major crisis. They've just lost a parent or whatever. So it, it's a variety. Of, and today, because of the pandemic and everything, we're seeing kids are very heightened. So there's a lot of kids with anxiety, so they provide, they teach kids how how to calm down, how to relax. They teach kids skills that help them adapt. They help families reach out and get services outside of the district. Uh, you know, there are a lot of kids that are in counseling today, and unfortunately, there's not there's not a lot of openings out there. So they help them navigate the system. I know, uh, like our BCBAs. Mike's often helping a family navigate the health system to get health insurance and to get home services uh, through you know different agencies. So the school adjustment counselor also goes into the classrooms 
they provide mindfulness, they provide, so they teach them skills, they teach them advocacy, they teach them resilience, they teach them rigor. Um, and uh, the PB, PBIS is, you know, the, they, they're like the leaders of the, <coughs> the pack, would you say? Um, they also do individual counseling and they do small group counseling. Um, they run lunch groups for the kids that, that struggle at lunch. They are out at recess navigating, the, <laughs> navigating you know, the, <laughs> the facilities and making sure the kids are climbing and they're sharing and, and doing all that. Um, they're a very integral part of, of the, the school culture. Um, they're the ones that are doing the safety planning. They're the ones that are, um, you know, planning for if there was ever an emergency. They also support family, uh, fa faculty when they're having some trauma, uh, when they're stressed out. So that it's a, in so many people will go to our school adjustment counselors that are staff and, and they're struggling, and they'll help <coughs> navigate that as well. So. Um, I can send you more information. No, no, that's that. great. You save me a lot of future time. Um, <laughs> thank you, and thanks for running for the hills every time Sean calls you back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that the other thing you you put in perspective too is you know we have twenty two hundred students coming to school every day. Um, so can in just in my own personal mm -hmm. family, we think our own personal family from September to June, some of the things that we deal with. Um, as you know, Deb said, um, per, um, family sickness, death in the family, um, unemployment, uh, for a parent getting laid off, divorce, I mean, just all of the things, human conditions that happen for adults um, will have an impact on our, our students. So mm -hmm. although adjustment I'll tell you, we could probably hire another 10 more adjustment counselors. <laughs> Never um, be enough. <laughs> because we have one or two adjustment counselors for, um, you know, the high school has two for 800 kids on a daily basis and all the stresses and, and all of that. So I think a lot of times what, what's happening in society trickles down. So we know in society for adults, um, there's a lot of depression, uh, a lot of anxiety, um, yeah. So that's, you know, that that's kind of what we deal with on a daily basis, and you know, our adjustment counselors do an amazing job. So yeah, they're impressive. I, I, I can, I'll be able to advocate in the budget for adjustment counselors if there's questions, but it's a, it's definitely a need, um, you know, for for our school system. It's changed, you know, my 46 years. It's really yeah. changed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, adjustment counseling was because you know, mom and dad had a fight. Now it's just so much more involved and so significant. And the other thing they work closely with is, is DCF, okay? And when there's 51 A's filed and things like that, or there's neglect or abuse, they're, they're the person that's on the line immediately. So. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Thank you so much, Deb. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. So next we have a proposal for uh, the um, fundraising advisory committee. Maybe if you want to just briefly present that, Mr. Callahan, I think we can move quickly to a motion. Yeah, we can move quickly to a motion on that. Uh, FinCom, as you know, talks about fundraising in every meeting we have. Yep. That will continue until I am no longer assigned to that subcommittee. <laughs> um, after the last discussion, Mayor Sean Reardon suggested forming an ad hoc group similar to the transportation group that we had. Uh, we think that's a great idea, I think. Um, so I asked people to be involved. Uh, Superintendent Gallagher, Member Walker, Vice Principal Testa, the Athletic Director, PTO Co-President Katie Suchecki, who has left. Yep. Um, Alex or Greg Coyer, who are part of the Boosters organization and Pam Keeley, if she will be interested in being in those meetings. She was in the transport one. Um, and anybody else in the school committee who wants to be there. Um, and Joanne Yell and Joanne would Yell. like to join. Right, Ms. Yell? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So You're just itching to do it, right? That's what it's you said. It's got a long history. From um, <laughs> so 
I, I haven't got a schedule or anything yet, so I want to make sure one we're going to vote on it, and then I will reach out to the people who express interest, and we'll sort that out. So, I think. So, all start. those folks you just mentioned, have you been in touch with them? Uh, yes, I saw yeah. Vice Principal Tesla the other day, randomly in the hallway at the high school um, after an NEF meeting. Um, I know KGC Chaki personally, and Alex and Greg Corr I know. So it's uh, yeah, the only person who doesn't know anything about it maybe is the athletic director. So right. it's up to Sean, about. as I would not contact staff. He's well aware. Okay, <laughs> so that's it. But I think we wait for Brianna to come back before we vote to make a motion. Yeah. Yep. Um, so do you want to go on to subcommittee updates until... Did you have any um, any updates for FinCom? No. We have not met. Right, because I, I don't really want to get into the policy work. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Work. right. Um, <laughs> so she's back. Can I, I can I, can we just talk about the... Sure. Not to vote? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, so on the advisory committee, I, I support this. I think it's helpful, though, if we do give sort of a time frame for sure. reporting back to the school committee so that we're not just because I think the point of an advisory committee is sort of to have a, a short term how goal. long was transportation you remember um, we reported uh, I think it was about I don't remember do we form in the spring and then report back in yeah. October or something well so my it's like thinking six on, months yeah my thinking on months. that is like with the transportation advisory we wanted to Inform the budget. We yeah. wanted to have the information in a timely manner before we were making decisions about bus fees, right? So I think we kind of have to work back from when do we want to have this information so it can inform the budget process, well, I, right? I don't, I mean, it's already, you know, they started doing fundraisers before school started. So if the whole reason for trying to call fundraising is because a lot of that stuff should be in the operational budget to begin with, we can talk about this and come up with a decision and implement it, but I wouldn't imagine we can implement it until next September. So we'd have to know, I mean, January, and then we have it all sorted, start all the budget stuff, and then it's, oh, when is that vote? I always forget. March? Me March. voting on the actual budget is probably March. more March. like March. April. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. well before the end, of, before that starts to happen. Because you want to handle on what the expenses are that really should be in the operational budget, yeah, right? Yeah, what the so. eventual policy is going to end up being, too, on mm -hmm. what they're allowed to fundraise for. And the other piece is what, what areas of fundraising are you, is it the whole district? Yeah. So that's a lot. Well, no, it's going to be, a, it's. Well, I'm it's saying because it's, you have athletic boosters, then you have clubs. That's fine. Boosters is easy. Then so you have. It's going to be anybody who wants to give us money has to follow whatever the rules end up being. Okay. And if they're going to be fundraising for things that should be in the budget, like uniforms, for example, then my answer is no. You can't fundraise for that. That's going to be in the operational budget. So what do you that's think? what this is actually for, to kind of sort out all those things. Ms. Walker, what do you think for a, kind of a sunset date on this? Because that, that's something I was interested in as well. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess it sounds like we might, have, we might end up having sort of two objectives, though. So one would be informing the budget. And the other would be uh, recommending policies. Right. And the, while those are both related, you know, we might there might be some carryover work on a policy or procedure that we want to, uh, you know, work on after we've done the budget part. So yeah. I wonder if maybe uh, working to have this this committee um, resolve its whatever its charge is by you know the end of this school year. And then we would be able to recommend, you know, maybe some procedural changes that could be implemented over the summer. But but also with the understanding that we'd be trying to inform the budget, so we might have some preliminary recommendations. It's early spring. Early spring. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I'd rather get it done <laughs> faster than, you know, not. But that's fine. So, say March 1st is the initial sunset date with potential to extend if we need to, mm -hmm. if that makes sense to everybody. That seems reasonable. Yeah. Plus, look, it gives us all the extra time to spend together. November, okay. December, January. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, by you know, by the time I'm just thinking about the timing of if we get to you know the end of the school year, and then there's maybe some policy work to be done, or hopefully done with the audit, and maybe what's left moves on to Correct. to policies plate. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah. I can think it'd be okay. it could be concurrent because if you went to one of the ad hocs and had that information back for your policy meeting, 
Mm -hmm. You can start talking with that group, who, yeah. uh, you know, whoever that group ends up being, because that's going to change potentially. <sighs> Dramatically, I wouldn't say right. potentially. Oh, right, you won't be here, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. My that's whole committee's true. leaving on me. I just don't want to pile on <laughs> too much alone. when they're doing the audit. That's the only thing. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, yeah. we won't delay the, it. The reality is that people joining policy are not going to have a lot of experience on yeah. the school committee. Right. right. Okay. Um, so, so yeah. So, do you see? How do you see this affecting the budget process for the next fiscal year? Well, do you I mean, see it? I mean, I guess I'm asking from the standpoint that if if there's certain items you mentioned uniforms, if there's uniforms that should be essentially covered in the operational budget, will that be brought to school administration attention, or how does it get brought to well, school administration? We're going to be having FinCom during this whole thing, so okay. I'll be informing <laughs> myself, I guess, and the other the other new people yeah. or new person what's going on so the superintendent will be there um and you know it's not it's not a secret you know my fincom meetings are always the same because i want to figure out right. what we're doing and why we're asking for well yeah like i say i just i guess i'm asking because you know being on fincom with you i i would like us to effectively d deal with this right especially in the next budget you know session coming up All right, so it's october 1st right so I will reach out this week to the people to see if they confirm they want to be anybody else have any recommendations for, you know, members, tell me. And then try and get it started before November. Okay. And our next FinCom meeting is the is next Thursday. Um, I mean, if I could get in touch with those people and they can come in and we can figure out a time and a schedule, then I would like to do it the following week if we could. And that also could be something you bring up when we have that joint meeting with the city council. Yes. Does anybody know what that is? What day that is? November fourteenth, I think it is. Okay. Is it the fourteenth? So. November fourteenth. So that's, a, that's independent of our two meetings that month, right? It is. Yeah. It's a Tuesday. Yeah. Since um, it's my last meeting, maybe I'll bring cupcakes. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so I think I think. Uh, yes. Put that in the minutes. Mr. Menon is bringing cupcakes. I think just to be consistent with our, our advisory committee policy, I think if we vote to form this committee tonight with the charge um, in the included in the packet, it would be good to um, at the next meeting just get a list of the members okay. um, because that is in our policy that we would confirm who the membership is. So, and I know you mentioned who they would be, but maybe if you're still, still reaching out. Tomorrow. And then I think um, the other thing is just uh, for all of us to be aware of advisory committees to the school committee have to are subject to the open meeting law, so we would have to publish. <laughs> good Lord, we would have to publish the, um, you know, just make sure the meetings are getting published. Yeah, yeah, yeah. appropriately no, and all that, good. posted appropriately and all that. Um, although we are not a quorum. Correct, but it it just we're subject to the open meeting law. Right. Yep. Is it okay to us for us to move forward, even though we don't have the list? I of think as members? long as yeah. people feel sure, comfortable they, voting on this. Uh, yeah, and, and some then, people may not be able to come to every meeting and all those things anyway. Right, um, but I think yeah. we should at least sure. know who's supposed to. And I'll to reach out tomorrow to all those people and see, so I can. Great. So then we have kind of a finalized document that we can just stick in the packet for next time. That would be great. Yes. Okay. So. All right. You want to make a motion? Motion is to form an advisory committee, as stated in policy BDF, to develop guidelines for school committee decisions. Related to fundraising for athletics clubs, student body activities, and external organizations such as the PTO and NEF, particularly when the purpose of the fundraiser is to supplement the operational budget. Second. Discussion? Just that we uh, agreed, or we are proposing that it would um, be for an interim deliverable March 1st with the potential to extend the committee to the end of the school year. Just Great, anything fun. else? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So there wasn't anything else for FinCom, right? Mr. All right, so we can. We want to take a room. quick recess because we're going to have the um, policies to go through, and I wondered if people might want to just take a sure. minute or a little yep. break. We'll take, let's take a five minute recess. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yep. <laughs>
can um, jump back in if you're ready, Ms. Walker. Yes, I am ready. We're clear in the room. <laughs> All right, so um, this next item is the second reading of policies D through H, D, E, F, G, H, um, as part of our policy audit. Um, so last time we reviewed uh, these policies first reading. Um, so any that we're carrying forward, I'm going to review tonight um, with any changes. So Section D uh, was the um, fiscal management. Also, I apologize, the packet I sent out said that we were going to be reading this on October 4th, not October 2nd. So, <laughs> nobody Didn't caught that. Didn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> I caught it, belatedly. So um, I, I, meant, I meant October 2nd tonight. We're not, I'm not making you come back on Wednesday. <laughs> Um, so for the Section D fiscal management, I'll just quickly scan through the, the um, revised policies. So for DA uh, fiscal management goals, there were no changes from first reading. Um, the proposed revisions would be to update it uh, to make it consistent with the MASC version. Um, section, uh, sorry, item DB, um, we re propose replacing with the MASC version. Um, this is the annual budget. Um, Policy. I'll slow down so if anybody has questions, just speak up. Um, the, no, I, I'm, no, I have no questions. Don't slow down. Don't slow down. <laughs> well, I am, I am, I am racing. Yeah. I don't want. I do. I tend to read. Move to approve. You're going to hear a lot of that. I know. <laughs> All right. Uh, policy DVD budget planning. Um, we're um, proposing to replace it with the MASC version. Uh, policy DBG, which is budget adoption procedures. We had some additions to our um, policy, but um, based on the MASC version. Um, policy DBH, um, we recommend it rescinding that policy because there is no reason to have it. Um, policy DD, um, we are proposing to replace it with the MASC version. That's grants, proposals, and special pro projects. Policy DEC is federal fund supplement, not supplant policy. Um, this is a, a codification of some rules that we are required to follow, so, um, and we don't have a current policy, so that's a new policy for us, DEC. Um, policy DH, uh, we just updated the legal reference. Policy DI is fiscal counting and reporting. Um, we just updated the legal references for that. Uh, policy DIE, uh, audits, <laughs> appropriately um, coded, is um, to replace that one with the more detailed version, MASC. The policy DJ, uh, also proposing to replace it with the more detailed version, which is the MASC version, and that is purchasing. And then policy DJA, purchasing authority, um, also proposing to replace that with the MASC version. Uh, slightly different wording, basically the same. Uh, vendor relations, which is DJG, uh, proposing to rescind that policy. So. Um, I have no questions. You have no questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Redding. Would we do we want to vote on these individually as sections? Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. I have no question. Oh, okay. Um, the DBH, the legal references, the charter. There's no weird legal issues if our charter says we have to do something but we choose not to? The, you're saying the legal DBH reference? Says I'm the legal DBH. reference was city charter? Uh, that's, yeah, so we're, we're proposing to rescind that policy. At where, we, where we need to reference the city charter, we do in other policies, but um, no, we don't, we're not required to have a, this policy just because it references the city charter. Is that what you're asking? No, I guess I was asking, does the city charter state that we have to have this policy? No, I don't believe it, no. Okay. All right. So I, um, I would make a motion that we approve policies uh, presented tonight um, for adoption. I'll second. And rescind. And rescission. In, in, in D? <laughs> Specifically in section D or? Specifically in section D. <coughs> okay. And there was a second? Sorry. Mr. Menon. Okay, discussion? All no questions. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Thank you. Thanks.
All right, so section E. Um, first one is EB, safety program. Um, and this is a revision to the first, uh, to, to some of the wording, but no, no substantial change. Oh, sorry. Never mind. Did I have EB? Yes. Yes, uh, change to the first paragraph, um, but no substantial change for that one. Um, the next one is EBB, which is first aid, also minor wording changes. Uh, emergency plans, EBC, minor, very, one, very minor word change to uh, remove the reference to Alice. Um, EBCD is a new policy. Um, it's a mask only policy right now. Um, so it has some information on emergency closings, which is basically what we do already, but it puts it into a policy, so. Um, EBCFA is the face cover coverings policy, which we're uh, proposing to remove completely. Uh, we're holding um, policy EC, so it's not in your packet tonight, um, but just referenced on the list. Um, we're gonna hold that and review that with the city, so we don't have to vote on that tonight. Policy ECAC related to, the van to vandalism, very minor wording changes. Policy ECAF, security camera in uh, <coughs> schools, uh, a change to the last paragraph related to law enforcement. Um, policy EDC, one wording change, and this is for authorized use of school owned materials. Policy EEA, student transportation services, update to the um, second paragraph, just more wording changes. Uh, file EEAE, which is school bus safety program, um, where wording adjustments or wording changes. Um, EEA, EA, bus driver examination and training um, updated in the last paragraph related to require, uh, quarry screening. And that's for dr bus driver examination and training, sorry. Um, file or policy EEAE -E, proposed to update to that to a reference B, so EEAE -E slash B. Um, drug and alcohol testing for school bus and commercial vehicle drivers. That's just a coding change. EEAC, AEC, which is student conduct on school buses, updating wording. Um, policy EFC, free and reduced price food services, just updating some wording. Um, there were uh, two others uh, that we were holding for review, just so, as general information. EEAG, which is student transportation and private vehicles, we're gonna review that. Um, and EFD, the meal charge policy, also review that. So those we'll probably bring back to you for another vote. So, um, any questions? I have no questions. <laughs> I'm so so glad you're so clear about that, Mr. Ben. Um, the uh, so I would make a motion that we um, adopt the uh, Section E policy revisions as presented this evening. Second. And any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Kind of see how this is going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next one is uh, section F. There are just two policies to review. Um, first one is FA, uh, very minor wording changes, and the second one is FF, naming new facilities, um, and we're holding that one. So the only vote tonight is on FA. Uh, so I'll move to, unless there's a question on that wording <laughs> change. Okay, uh, vote to um, approve policy FA as presented. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Next policy is policy, I mean, sorry, section G. So um, policy GBA, equal opportunity, employment opportunity, um, proposing to replace that with the MASC version. Uh, next one is Policy GBEA, which is staff ethics, conflict of interest, um, minor wording adjustments. Policy GBEB, which is related to staff contact, conduct, sorry. <coughs> um, we had some language in there that we're gonna move to the, propose moving to the personnel handbook, so we removed that from this policy. Um, policy GBEBC, gifts to staff and solicitations by staff, um, very minor wording changes and an update to the reference. G 
GBEC, drug-free workplace policy, uh, legal reference update, and also um, just making sure our coding is correct. Um, policy GBED, tobacco use on school property by staff prohibited, cross-reference update. GBGB, also a legal reference update. GBGE, which is domestic violence leave policy, um, legal reference update. Um, the next one is GBI, um, propose replacing it with the MASC version. Sorry, that is for staff participation in political activities. Um, GBJ, which is personnel records, um, minor wording changes. Policy GCA, which is professional staff positions, uh, wording uh, adjustment. And policy GCBA, professional staff salary schedules, um, replacing it with the MASC version. This includes uh, principals and administrators. Uh, policy GCBB is employment of principals, um, just some minor wording changes and a cross reference update. Uh, policy GCBC. Oh, yeah. Jump in. Yeah, just on uh, GCBB. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if this fits in there. And uh, I know we kind of went through it when we met as a subcommittee. But it used to be that when there were raises made to uh, administrators in the in the district, that the school committee would get the amount of the aggregate raise, and then we would vote to approve it. And as I look at this language, uh, again, it says, said contract shall be submitted to the school committee for their approval of all terms concerning compensation benefits prior to the presentation of a con contract of employment to the principal. So I think it would be fiscally responsible for us as a, as a school committee to know what the aggregate increase is going to be for an upcoming year. You know, it may be significant, it may not be significant, it may be for two principals, it may be for six, I don't know, uh, or six administrators, I should say. But uh, we used to do this, and uh, we've kind of gotten away from it. And when I say used to, I'm going back to the early, you know, like 2006, uh, seven, eight, or 2004 and five for sure. So, uh, I don't know where that fits in, and I know Ms. Keeley's in the audience, uh, and I'm not looking for an answer, but I think that, uh, again, to display some fiscal responsibility, uh, I think the school, because it says right here, submitted to the school committee for approval of all, all terms uh, concerning compensation and benefits. I just think that uh, that may be a, a action that you know we need to do in the upcoming mm -hmm. budget session and I, I know i won't be here but uh that may be something be to watching. do <laughs> i can always come in for public comments yes, remind can. people yes. of that I so <laughs> just to clarify then you're you're supporting this policy but you would like practice to reflect the policy is that accurate yeah okay yeah and i think that i my, my view is that this policy does support that practice so i agree okay see what what time of year would you what would, the, would that be? It generally, when the contracts are going to get renewed, it's generally before July 1st. Yeah, like the, the new the three year contract? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically, the new what? The three year or the beginning of every year? Basically, of the basically what the superintendent would present us is, is with how much the administrative pay raises are and what the aggregate of that amount is. So it could be like 35000 and then we vote on whether that's we approve it or we don't approve it. Okay. Can I clarify I, at the beginning of I, every three years or every year? When uh, uh, when an administrative contract is up, yeah. there's new terms. So there's like a pay increase, right. right? So if there's like, say there's three principals that are getting a pay increase for next fiscal year, uh, when their contracts come up before, before their we as a school committee have to approve that increase. Right. The superintendent would bring it to us, and we as a school committee would approve the aggregate. Okay, we don't we don't necessarily approve the ind individual increase, sure. but it's the a yeah. aggregate. So fiscally, we're being responsible for. Mm -hmm. And that should be for every union contract. Yes, not just the administrators. 
Yeah, the union contracts are set. We approve the union. Yeah, the union contracts are set. Right, we approve the union contract once, not every year when the when they right. move steps or anything. Right. Theoretically, but we haven't we done do it for principles budget. quite some time. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't have a question, but I I do. Uh, <laughs> I I have to say that I I just have no recollection of of that. Well, but, you know, and that doesn't necessarily mean it didn't happen. No, As a matter I, of fact, it might mean that it did happen because yep. I don't recollect it. But I, I refer to you to one Dick Sullivan Jr. who who can tell you all about it. Who? Dick Sullivan Jr. Yeah. 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 Well, that goes. That's I know, way back. Yeah, that's twenty-two 2005, years. Two thousand five, two thousand six. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So, but we're we're comfortable with the the language in the policy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so moving on to DCBC, which is Professional Staff Supplementary Pay Plans, just a wording change. Uh, GCE, which is Professional Staff Recruiting posting and Posting of Vacancies, um, also a wording change. GCF, Professional Staff hi Hiring, um, we're going to uh, propose replacing that with MSC version. Uh, policy GCIA, <coughs> Philosophy of Staff Development, update um, the... the uh, delete a couple uh, sentences. GCJ, which is professional teacher status, uh, just update, update some wording. GCK, um, professional staff assignments and tran transfers, update the wording. Policy GCQF, suspension, dismissal of staff members, uh, update the wording, or sorry, insertion of some text. Uh, policy GCRD, tutoring for pay, uh, some, some updating of wording, and that is the end of Section G. And we did, we were going to hold one policy, which is policy GBEBD, um, not in your packet tonight, hold for the review by the uh, Finance Committee. I'm putting that on the agenda for next week. Perfect, thank you. So I will move to approve, uh, for adoption, the um, sec the policies in Section G as presented tonight. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Section H. Uh, the, this one we only have two as well. Yeah. Uh, section H, HA, negotiation goals. Uh, just a legal reference update. Uh, sec policy HB, negotiations legal status, um, inserting some language um, to the MASC version. So it's basically a merging of our two. I'm sorry, there's a third. Um, policy HF, which is school committee negotiating agents updating some wording. And that concludes section H. Any questions on that? Okay. So I will move to uh, adopt the policies for Section H as presented. Second. Discussion? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Well done. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Welcome. A lot of Thank work. You. Thanks, everybody. Superintendent's report. All right. We get a nice long version <laughs> of this one. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Superintendent report started back in 2018, September. Oh, no. I'm just kidding. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Um, just some important items I'll, I'll go through pretty quick. You've heard, I think, some of these uh, through my Friday memos also. So I think working and trying to um, fit in some budget-based workshops, um, because there's a lot of a lot of other activities going on, but these are the dates that we have, tentatively. Uh, we haven't shared it with the community yet, um, but we'll advertise. So we're looking at Thursday, November second, to work with the Bresnahan um, parents and guardians. Then we go on tour to the uh, high school, uh, looking on Wednesday, uh, November fifteenth. And then um, Thursday, we'll go back to back. Thursday for the Knock Mullen School for our budget based workshops. And then we'll plan on starting at 6 
and we'll run through like a nice protocol where everyone that shows up will be part of the process and all the voices <laughs> will be heard. So those so are the three dates that we have. Knock Mullen, will that be one? When you say back to back, is it one and then the other? Or is no, I think, we, I think we can have four the whole, to eight together. I think we can have the okay. four to eight together. What was the date on the Knock Mullen? That one is going to be on Thursday, 11-16. And then high school will be Wednesday, 11-15. Got it. And we're, we're in between, you know, performances, fall plays, parent, you know what I mean? So looking at the uh, parent conferences, these are the dates that kind of fit in, and we will open those nights. And plus, we'll be working, the site councils will be working with their principals, developing their budget priorities tied to their improvement plan. And that will give us enough time as we begin our individual meetings with, you know, budget holders and principals. Then we go into December and we start pulling it all together. So what time are these at? Six o'clock. And is there expectation, Madam Vice Chair, that um, there's some participation from school committee members? Are we trying to get... Yeah, that was my, <laughs> my hope is that we would all plan on attending one of these. Okay. Do we want to, Do we need to coordinate on that? Well, I asked the superintendent to bring the dates tonight so that we could potentially do that. I, I know okay. not everyone has access to their schedule, but if anyone wants to jump on a particular night, I don't, are there concerns about there being a well, quorum? I think, of, of, oh. That probably wouldn't happen anyways. But um, Yeah, that would mean the meeting would have to be posted. Yeah, it just and, means and it has to be posted, yeah. I think we should probably for... I'd rather um, avoid that anyways. Of, just I think we should post it out of uh, caution. Sure, okay. Yeah. Post the meetings? It's just put on yes. the calendar. Yeah. yeah, right. So we could go to more than one. That's a question, but. Sure. That is a question. <laughs> no more questions from you, Bruce. <laughs> right. Um, so if four of us end up at one of these meetings, I mean, the last time four of us in a room was like a Christmas party. So what happens? Um, we, as long as we're not, I mean, we're not bringing up anything that we're voting on per se. We don't have to vote on anything in that meeting. And ultimately, we don't even vote when the budget from that school comes to us because we're voting on the whole budget. Right. Okay. So we're also there to listen primarily, right. not trying to yeah. answer any questions. We should try to avoid answering questions mm -hmm. and let that, the staff answer the questions. Right, more observing. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd be interested in going to the high school one since I have a student there. Yeah, All right. I would jump on that one. I'll go to Bresnahan. Great. Anyone else want to? I'll probably go to most of them, actually. You know, it's my. You just can't get my, enough. Your last well, year no, off. Well, no, it's my. It's my. It's my. It's another you know, standing O's. My final tour. <laughs> no standing O's. No standing O's. <laughs> um, I'm probably. Yeah, I, I think I feel the same way as Mr. Mena, and I'd probably try to go to all of them. Okay. That's okay. I just have to double check. Mr. Yeah. Cole? I may do the same. Take them all in. So did you say we're going to post this as a meeting? Well, it's not going to be posted as a no, meeting. No, it's a public we'll, meeting. We'll put it on the calendar, focus groups. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we just have to make sure that we're, you we should post it as a public meeting. Because, so yeah, the quorum, yeah. Yeah, norm, a normal, like how we would post a meeting. Yeah. Okay. That's good. It'll probably be more, we'll, we'll work on because it would be more of a workshop, not necessarily like a forum. Mm -hmm. So people should understand they'll be participating and not, you know. Deliberating. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, and could you send that info out to the mayor since he's not here tonight just so that he can participate as well? <coughs> okay. 100%. Great. Thank you. All right. Yep. Some more things? Yeah, <laughs> some more things. More things. Um, as the students referenced, the NEASC uh, visit, um, you know, uh, it's there. I've been part of two of them back in the day. Um, it's an awesome opportunity for self-reflection and then really looking at the accreditation standards. I've learned, you know, the standards have changed since the last time I, I've been through them. Not, not too significantly, though. So standard one is learning culture. Standard two is student learning. Standard three is professional practice. 
student four is learning support and then learning resources. And I know the team had a great opportunity to meet with some of our school committee members, also who serve as parents. So that was really nice. Um, so there's three phases. So we just finished the self-reflection. If you recall last year, we talked about um, the NIAS process and there's different committees at the school level and all those uh, five standards. Um, Erin Hobbs and uh, Catherine Taggart just did an amazing job. So they were the leads pulling in all of that information, going through all of the documents for the self-study. So they did all of that last year. They worked on it over the summer. They submitted our self-study to the NIAS visiting team. Um, and that team was just so complimentary how thorough it was. It was over a 100-page report that they wrote. Um, with evidence uh, tied to that. So part of that, uh, the team came in last week um, and worked for four days. They visited classrooms, as the students were saying, looking at uh, student data, uh, analyzing all four of those standards. They also did student shadow days. So it's a very comprehensive um, visit. At the end of the visit, um, the four to six weeks, they're going to have the written report, then they'll send it to the principal, send it to myself, um, which will give us an opportunity on focus areas. So the difference between the, the old and the new is they reduce the standards a little bit, um, but you would have to write a two-page, like um, a two-year report of where you're at with their uh, recommendations. Um, Today, you not only do you write that report, but the visiting team comes back year two to look at your progress. So part of that report, they'll have short-term goals that um, they'll give to the administration and the high school faculty, and then some longer-term goals as part of the school improvement plan. So, um, you know, there was just a, a great process just on the uh, areas that they, um, you know, we just, you always ask, like, you know, informally, you know, what are some of the things, um, and it ties directly to the report too. So the the well written report, the high school. So the ongoing curriculum work uh, at the high school uh, will be an area. Uh, building space, as they toured the spaces and and they looked at the high school building spaces. Um, staff voice, um, part of encouraging that continuing, uh, and then also voice with professional development and then a lot of the work Deb was talking about is the intervention response to intervention for um, so those are like some global things that uh, will come up I think um, but we're looking forward to that but I really you want to thank Erin Hobbs and Kathleen Taggart for all of their work um, and they championship that whole process so we'll probably be recognizing that. I was going to say it sounds like a staff recognition. Yeah absolutely question yeah so um, first uh, two questions uh, first is there a cost to the district to do this accreditation yes mm -hmm. what is the so we've been that? budgeting it's been five thousand um, dollars mm -hmm. uh, last year and then this year and then we also pay um, the co-chairs a stipend for their extra work um, so that's where that's the budgeted yeah um, okay and that. then do we do a similar accreditation process for the other schools, or is it just the high school? We don't. Just the high school, but that's something that uh, NEASC has done. Um, we can, and I was talking to Phil Conrad, who is, um, you know, the chair of that, um, because I always felt it was a valuable process, um, especially with the instructional practice of going, moving from a, maybe a traditional classroom more to, um, you know, a, a I guess, you know, skills-based in instruction type of a class. Mm -hmm. um, but they do have district accreditation, so I did talk to them about that a little bit. So I think I will follow up, because I think that would also tie. They, they looked at our strategic plan, and I think we were one of the few districts that they've ever seen that took that portrait of a graduate and brought it all the way down to the elementary level. So they were really impressed with that, which made me start thinking the same thing, mm -hmm. like maybe an accreditation process for the entire district. Um, so we'll definitely look at that. Okay. Um, great suggestion, though. All right, next, I have, um, I just want to thank Jenny Donahue, one of our city co counselors. 
lots and lots of synopsis. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whoa. Who was lots that? Lots of wow. synopsis. You're running a play of a little... <laughs> yeah, it's by, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer on the side. It's a side hustle. Yeah. Bruce, and I, question. Bruce and I are working on a, uh, on a novel. So... <laughs> Wow. It's not a school committee comedy. No. <laughs> it's a drama. It's turned into a drama. Um, so going back to my... So you met with Counselor Donahue. Met with, um, uh, via phone conference with uh, Jenny Donahue. So part of what we're doing, what we're supporting, is the October 13th showing for Crip Camp, which is a documentary film showcasing the, you know, the origin of disability rights and it's a wonderful movie. Part of that um, is she reached out making sure we had um, assisted listening systems um, updated. And so it was a great conversation because working with Steve Burkholm, we need to update uh, some of those systems. So I just want to thank her for you know, pointing that out. Part of that conversation, Deb O'Connor was also in the room, but I think what we're going to do is um, work with uh, Ms. Donahue and have her just making sure we're compliant, ADA compliant with, you know, everything that we're doing. Um, so that was a great conversation, but I want to thank her for that. So we are going to upgrade the NARC and we should be ready um, for that showing. And then we'll also, we have that system at the high school, but uh, Steve's going to look at that, but I think we have to order some parts for that too. Um, just, yeah, the, um, the showing is being put on by the DEI and the um, Commission on Disabilities um, and it is for Friday, February 13th from 6 to 8. There'll be a panel discussion. And um, as amazing as this was to me, I've seen the movie. And I was working not, at not the... Not February. No, I'm sorry. Not October 13th. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. February 13th. Okay. But I was, I was working... <laughs> there were two camps for children and adults with disabilities in, the, in that area. I was working at the other camp and actually recognized several of the campers as campers that I had worked with wow. in the movie. Um, that was a long time ago. The movie takes place in the early 70s. But, yeah. You know, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. No, it's, it's going to be, um, uh, we think it's going to be a great uh, event. We sent it out uh, for our families, so hopefully people can attend. Um, that would be nice. Um, just two open houses. Um, some of the high school parents are here. They went to Mr. the Wolf's open house. Always a lot of energy, um, although his technology didn't work, but he did talk about Portrait of a Graduate. Um, and then the pr um, parents and guardians got to do an abbreviated schedule, meet the teachers. Um, it was just a, a great opportunity. Our student ambassadors, the student leaders were also there as guides, which is also a nice... Uh, ties into a lot of that work we've been with student leadership and kids just really wanting to help out. Then I also attended the Mullen Open House and just want to thank uh, Miss Rossi and uh, Curtis Pere, uh Lee, Miss CP as they call her, the kids call her, the assistant principal for all their work. Similar, parents came in, they got, they sat down, they uh, met with the teachers, teachers kind of gave an overview. Um, so it was just a wonderful night. People excited, happy, glad to be back. So um, I interrupted a few times, but that's what I do. I'm good at that. Um, and then the other, I had another opportunity, um, the KPN League Sportsmanship Summit. Once again, Newburyport is taking the lead with this. Uh, the past couple of years, uh, Mr. Hudson also assisted with organizing this training program. So the idea of this is to have the 12 schools, um, the captains of all the different sports teams, they work together on uh, you know different leadership scenarios, different problem solving, but it has it's not as much on what happens on the field, it's the decorum and the fan behavior of the student bodies. So when you know kids go out and uh, communities go out and they watch games, how can the how can they take a leadership role with their own peers about, you know, good behavior in the stands? Um, so it was a, a great opportunity for all of these different um, student athletes, the athletic directors, and the principals all came because it's such an important aspect. 
um, of treating people with respect, especially the student athletes. Did they talk about parents? Uh, mm. Well, we can only control what we well, can control. I don't know. I think, but yeah, do, I think do I, some lessons from our students. So if I agree. There's a way to share that. Yeah. Some of the highlights. I think that that's one of the challenges for some of those student leaders yes, that agree. how um, their family members act in the stands. And other fans. Too. And then how do you, as a student leader, as the child of parents, how do you try to engage in, you know, so I agree. I am, um, it is, I mean, it's um, the the discourse, oh, it's Phil, he's writing a book too. Um, the public discourse has trickled down. <laughs> Um, so that was great. I want to thank all the captains. I want to thank Newburyport for taking the lead in, in uh, driving that initiative. And that's all I have. I have two items for new business, but I'll wait. So there you go. Okay. Uh, I, have, I have one item for new business, which is um, our October 16th meeting, which is the next one is now October 23rd. So it's one week later. That was the solution. I brought it up last last time, October 16th. City Council moved their meeting to the 16th, so we needed to get bumped. Um, we've confirmed the Senior Center is available. We can have the meeting recorded. Um, so that's one week later, October 23rd. And Ms. Yell, I believe you, you already went in and put it in as canceled. If people look on the 16th, they can see that that is canceled and moved to the 23rd. So hopefully we can uh, get the word out there. I'll yeah. get it out there in the newsletter. Um, I don't think that there's anything else about that, just for everyone to be aware and spread the word. And it'll oh, be, be here? The, yes, here at the Senior Center, which we can. <coughs> um, the one thing that really made me feel comfortable with that is because there, there are um, <coughs> five Mondays in October, the next meeting will be two weeks later. So yeah. that, that felt reasonable. So. Um, you said you had some new business? Yes, a nice newsletter, by the way. Oh, <laughs> glad it worked out. I receive it. Can it come to us, too? Oh, it you didn't? Have. Oh, okay. You did? Well, yeah. Did parents. It, uh, did, did, it yeah. just went out to yeah. school parents, right? Oh, so yeah, but you all oh. should be on that. Too. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, got, I got it. Yeah. All right, we'll look, got it? Get it. We'll look mm. into that. <laughs> yes. All right. Okay. Um, just some new business, and I think what came out of uh, our transportation um, subcommittee was how do we promote walking uh, and you know roll, you know we walk to roll to school, but how do we work with our community to have more students you know walk um, to school when you know the weather's nice? So part of that and working with uh, Member Walker and NYS is we really had a nice brainstorm right when school opened, um, how on the school side, how we can promote this, and then also uh, NYS. Uh, so we're really partnering and really getting the message out, but the walk and roll Wednesdays, uh, first big kickoff will be October 11th. Uh, as I said, we're partnering with NYS. They found some grants, uh, grant funding, so we have uh, a liaison at each one of the schools that's working with NYS and working with the family, so we're excited about that. Um, and there's going to be Anna Jake's, the different areas where families can meet um, is Anna Jake's, NYS Rec Center, the Bartlett Mall, Cushing Park, Colton Drive, and Atkinson Common. Those are the different areas where everyone will gather in the morning and then we'll all walk to school. The idea of that is to bring you know, community together, different parents together, the students together, so then you have groups of students that will eventually start walking to school. So um, we're going to send a lot more information the closer we get. And I'm not sure, did I have everything there, Ms. Walker? Or yeah, I think you did. And you did think, all right? I think Member Callahan should post his I map. Forgot, of I forgot about this. I made a subway has. map version of the map, diagrammatic <laughs> version, awesome. instead of looking at the Maybe city map. Maybe we can share wow. that so in the cool. next news. Yeah, we, should, uh, we <laughs> could send that out. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, th thank you for mentioning that, because it's actually next Wednesday, and um, uh, I am going to be um, at Cushing Park. If anybody would like to join me there to walk to whoever shows up, although last year nobody showed up. <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't that. because of me. <laughs> that happened to me too. Question. Oh. But, 
bring your questions. That's right. Um, but I, I do, I, I just want a second. I think the, the idea here was that, you know, since COVID, we've struggled to get that those habits restored. Yep. And, you know, we had a lot of enthusiasm <coughs> around walking bike to school days um, pre-COVID. And um, the NYS has, has great support for this and they can they can provide a lot of materials, which didn't happen in the past because they, they, did, they weren't our partner in the past. So it's awesome, this partnership is great. And I think having the champions in each school is gonna be really helpful. Mm -hmm. So I, agree. I think this is a great model and I hope it's gonna, gonna result in some kids and students and families walking and biking to school together. Um, but I did wanna just say part of my new business today was just um, suggesting that, you know, I, I heard the parent, I know we've all aware, been aware of some of the concerns that have been expressed, um, and I and totally relate. I think there are places where it's not safe for students um, to walk on their own, and we, I am concerned about the, the crossing guard issue, um, and I don't know what the solution is, because this really isn't a school committee only situation. Uh, issue, it's, uh, or, or a school district. I mean, these are really issues that are related to our city <coughs> as a whole. But if, if we could have some way to work through this um, collaboratively, at, particularly as we approach the budget, um, you know, I'd like to have a conversation about the crossing guard um, situation and whether or not, first of all, whether or not that crossing guard should even be in our school budget or whether they should be part of the city budget but also the, the pay and whether that's a challenge. So things like that, but then if we could, you know, figure out a way to collaborate with the mayor to just make sure there's more um, information being shared about some of the um, initiatives that the city is working on, because I know that, I know the mayor thinks this is an important initiative, you know, to make sure our, our community is walk, is more is safe to walk in and ride, ride around. It's not an easy fix, but um, communication is really critical. When people see, you know, if there's a stoplight broken, who do they call? If there's no crossing guard, who do they call? If there's a, you know, pedestrian light broken, who do they call? If there's a, there is brush, brush over the sidewalk, who do they call? So I, I think our staff in the city are very responsive, but not everybody knows who to direct those, those concerns to. So, so maybe we can just work going forward with the mayor and figure out a good way to communicate better about those things. Do you happen to know is is there still a public safety? Committee, I know they. There is. There is. I think it's. Yeah, I believe it's a public safety committee. It might have another. Uh, yeah, because I, yeah. I, I know they reconfigured the committees last yeah. year, but that or whatever the correct one is, would would anyone be willing to volunteer to? Exactly. Reach there is out. a transportation safety. I'm I'm happy to reach out. Just sure. reach out to their, yeah. their chair, <laughs> and just just Jim so they, me. just for an awareness at least yeah. that this has come to our attention and yeah. we're not. We're trying to figure out how to move forward on it in a collaborative way. Mm -hmm. Maybe they put it on their agenda and we go. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, but a conversation to at least get that started. Thank you for taking that on. Yep. Is there any other new business? I have one more. All right. <laughs> this is actually. Um, so working as part of from last year's conversation on safety to this year we did you know all of the upgrades um but having our new uh dean mr antonelli um also brought some ideas on safety and we met with the um police and the fire and one thing they used to do out in westford is designate um a day that the police and fire can utilize a school and practice the safety uh, drills in there. Um, so what we've penciled in is right now it's um, the 21st, uh, it's a Saturday, and the idea is working with our police and fire department that we would, um, they would be on site at the high school and we would run through different scenarios for them. So what that does, one, they practice the scenarios, but the other thing that's really important is that the fire in the police department get very familiar with inside the buildings. Um, so this is just right now a draft date, but uh, once we solidify it, it would, I'm gonna also push out information to the uh, school community because if 
it's a Saturday afternoon or a Saturday morning and you're driving by and there's, right. you know, nine police yeah. cars and four fire trucks at the high school. So we would definitely, once we solidify that date and, and what's going to be happening, we'll communicate that out. And then the other piece, um, we'll reach out to the mayor too, um, just so the whole community knows that. But I think it's just another step in the right direction and, and um, I'm really excited about, you know, trying this out. Um, you know, for our emergency personnel. They were really excited uh, to have that opportunity. So that's all my new business for tonight. Is that going to happen at all the buildings? I think we're going to do uh, start the high school first, yeah. Um, and then we'll plan, you know, we'll plan it out. The other piece that the marshal um, and also our fire department, they do, we also work with them on the drills anyways. Um, and the marshal is really... Um, the patrol, um, as the daytime patrol is patrolling, they come into all the buildings and they do a walk around. Um, so they're familiar, but this, this way we'll be able to um, work on different scenarios that could happen, um, you know, for the police and fire department. So, yeah. Great. All right. So... I'm not making a motion to adjourn, but I am making a motion that we move to executive session for the purpose of discussing possible litigation and legal matters and not to reconvene in open session. I think we need a roll call. We do need a roll call. Do we need a second on second. that? Because it's a motion. Second for Mr. Cole, and we need a roll call. Rihanna Higgins? Yes. Julia Walker? Yes. Brian Callahan? Yes. Steve Cole? Yes. Menon? Yes. Sarah Hall? Yes. Mayor Rin is absent. Thank you.